Uh, this is probably a good time to point out that um, there was birds chirping in my recording that you might be able to hear once I send you those files. So get ready for that, too. <laughs> <laughs> chirping birds will be the least of the problems this episode. <laughs> yeah, there's dogs barking. Like we, we do what we can. What do you expect? Hello, my beautiful cactuars and chocobos. Friends, thank you for joining us today on the Nintendo Everything Podcast. This is episode 43. I am your host, Oni Dino. With me, I have a witcher who didn't make it. It's Galen. Oh no, that is not listenable. <laughs> that is not listenable at all. But that was a really good impression of the, the Witcher 3 music. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so... We've recently gained some new listeners, so I just want to reintroduce the show to anybody who is joining us for the first or second time. We are a weekly show. Episodes go live every Sunday. I, Onidino, am a Japanese translator, and my co-host Galen here is a jack-of-all-trades who's done some acting, voice work, and game programming work as well, haven't you? I have indeed. <laughs> We have a lot of news to cover this week with a ton of like game debuts, details, gameplay, all that stuff coming out of Gamescom and Indie World. But unfortunately, we had to boil it down. Otherwise, it'd be like a four hour episode. <laughs> so, so basically, it would be a regular episode? <laughs> no, shut up. <laughs> so if, <laughs> if by the end of this episode, dear listener, you are still left unsatisfied because we didn't talk about the thing you wanted to hear about, please, by all means, do write into us at nintendoeverythingpod at gmail.com you can ask us to analyze anything you want to hear galen and i cover or you can ask uh, life advice as well we are so well-rounded over here including galen very well-rounded at the nintendo everything podcast <laughs> i'm sorry galen <sighs> i just had to throw it in there i don't know i'm just i'm mean yeah yeah that, that for new listeners that is also a theme that you'll pick up in the show that I am Oni the is, nicest. Oh, Oni is mean. Sometimes Galen's mean. I like to think of it more as endearing than mean. Like, cheeky. Mm, we'll let the listeners describe which... I, I set that up so for you so well. <laughs> what, to talk about butts? You know how much I love butts. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> Now, before we go any further, I have to talk about the handsome elephant in the room. We have joining us today a special guest. It is Jared from Avalanche Reviews. Jared, what up? Hey, pleasure to be here. Uh, that that very well may be the first time I've been called a handsome elephant, but uh, hopefully not the last. <laughs> so listeners at home will notice right away that Jared has a very smooth, very bassy voice. <laughs> <laughs> let's listen to him speak a little bit more jared who are you and what do you do yeah so like you said i'm uh, avalanche jared i run the youtube channel avalanche reviews and i uh i guess you could describe it as i i yell into the ether about video games <laughs> <laughs> and i try my hardest to talk about games that maybe um didn't get a fair shake or, or that people don't talk about enough in my opinion which isn't exactly on purpose I just play a lot of really weird games that only me and 16 other people tend to get into which is most <laughs> of my subscriber base so that's good yeah that's exactly how I found you on YouTube like years ago I don't remember I I realized it the other day and now I've forgotten so great good job pod ghost, podcast <laughs> host uh I was just searching up like some game that you know you don't see a lot of videos of on the internet and your trashed classics came up and then that's how I got to know you through your trash classic series that you do on YouTube and mm. I was stuck in immediately. Well that's good to hear. Uh, <laughs> you know I should do more of those videos. I haven't been doing as many as I should. You know what the, the crappy thing is is I started off with trash classics being the, uh, the really short and sweet like so I didn't have to do a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And as my videos kept getting longer and more uh, in-depth, mm -hmm. Trash Classics began, like, the little six-minute videos turned into, like, 12 or 15. And uh, <laughs> so now it's becoming more work, but I, it's a little more rewarding, so I guess it kind of works out. That's cool. You should consider, like, 
a new segment, or not a new segment, but a new uh, moniker for like a quick one, and you intentionally mm. make it under like eight minutes, so that way it's not daunting on you. That'd be great. That's really what I need to do. It's so hard to shut up once you start, though. Like once you start <laughs> talking about graphics or a story, it's it's so easy to just keep jawing on and on, which is what I'm good at. Yeah, yeah. So Jared, I wanted to ask you about being a YouTuber, um, being a streamer on Twitch, which is a new uh, venture that you've recently oh, gone yeah. into. So mm -hmm. what was your inspiration for starting up your YouTube channel and how many years ago was it? That's a very good question. I think it was around, I want to say at, at the very least six years, maybe even seven years ago when I started uh, the, the Avalanche Reviews YouTube channel and it you know, I, I watched a lot of video game reviews, and I really, that's how I filled my time. And I watched a lot of reviews of games I already played and, and knew about and had already mm. formed opinions of. And I just enjoyed the process of seeing gameplay along with someone's opinion. Like, there was something about it. You know how you, when you have your favorite show, you can just turn your brain off and turn it on, and then two hours just flies by? Oh, yeah. Like, mm -hmm. that's how it was for me with, with YouTube game reviews. I just... and. The, the combination of the visuals of the video game running and then the audio of, here's a, a fun little fact, you know, the developer did this before they did the game or something. That just always blew me away. And I've kind of sort of been a, a creative type of person throughout my life. I, I started as a kid with drawing and I really liked that. And then I criticized myself too much and I thought I, was, I, I wasn't good <laughs> enough for the age I was, so I just stopped. And then I got into music and me and my friends started a death metal band and toured the U.S. And I've awesome. just kind of always been into, like, expressing my creativity in really, like, I don't know, kind of, like, hard ways to do. So YouTube was the next logical step in that case. And uh, I, I think it started with a conversation on a car ride. We went to go see uh, Cannibal Corpse up in Tampa. I live in South Florida. And on the mm. way home, a friend of mine was like, so, like, what have you been doing lately? And it just came to my head. I kind of want to review video games and <laughs> that's how it, that's how most things in my life start is like just with that out loud you say it and then it's like oh have I been thinking that this whole time and I thought to myself boy I my favorite game in the whole world is Silent Hill 3 I'd love to review that and proceeded to do just that awesome and it's worked out pretty well for you your channel has gotten bigger and bigger across the years like of course it takes time but you're oh, sure. kind of upwards of almost 40k subscribers now on youtube i'm at 36 but okay. uh the way things are going it's 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 headed in that direction it's it's pretty damn exciting that's amazing and then you recently did a, a series of videos with resident evil retrospective and that became really popular for you right yeah, that's. I think that's where all the growth came from. For that full, you know, five and a half, six years that I had the channel, mm. I think uh, I had gotten somewhere in the neighborhood of seven thousand subscribers, which was good. You know, it was pretty cool. But you know, a thousand subscribers a year isn't what you call a continuous growth by any means. Mm. And then I, I, I released the Resident Evil retro. Is it's actually an interesting story. There was a hurricane down here in South Florida, and I didn't have internet for a very long time but the power came back on relatively soon so I was stuck at home and my job was shut down until they renovated so I was just here with my video games and I thought to myself you know I'm bored why not just play every Resident Evil game <laughs> and then I did that and I, uh, I captured all the footage because luckily I was already set up to capture and I have the frame meister and everything here and mm. I was playing through all of them, and I was using my wife's, because uh, my cell phone, uh, I, I got zero reception. For some reason, I think one of my cell towers got destroyed, but hers was good, so I used her iPhone to look up, like, you know, little, you know, the Resident Evil 2 Wikipedia to, you know, look up certain dates and stuff, and just started writing scripts, and I had about up to Resident Evil 5 finished within, like, the few months it took for me to actually get working again and for the internet to be back like to working order and I started you know editing through the footage and stuff without the internet and when I finally got the internet back it had turned out that the Resident Evil 2 remake that everybody had heard about years ago um, <laughs> had finally shown some you know people had been interested in it and they finally released footage and teasers and it was actually coming we all thought it was vaporware yeah yeah and 
I just <laughs> happened to have a Resident Evil 2 and Resident Evil 1.5 video on the internet maybe, I don't know, a week before that stuff uh, finally leaked. So when they started talking about Resident Evil 1.5 content in the remake, when you searched Resident Evil 1.5, I was the second result on YouTube, which was crazy. Oh, wow. And so in a year, I, I got more growth than I'd ever seen on YouTube ever. <laughs> and uh, it, it put me up to 30,000 subscribers uh, within, I think it was less than a year even. It might have been like seven, eight months. It was crazy. That's great. I particularly loved your retrospective series because you talked about all of the offshoot games too. So a bunch of yes. games that I didn't play, like Operation Raccoon City or whatever. Mm -hmm. It was great to hear somebody that I not even agreed with, like all of your opinions or something, but just somebody who right. was as dedicated to this series as I was talking about a game that I was never going to play and then hear your right. take on it was so fascinating. Yeah, I, I kind of, I was a little uh, hardcore about it. I At first, <laughs> I, I wanted to only do the numbered entries. And I, the only, uh, you know, the only one that I was going to do that wasn't numbered was Code Veronica because I love Code Veronica so much. And it was technically supposed to be RE3. So that's I, the I let real that RE3, slide. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, that's That was exact my exact opinion. But then I, I put up, uh, I had recently started a Patreon and the growth was good. And I was like, well, let's see what everybody else wants. So I, mm. I set a Patreon goal and I was like, if you guys want this you know, series to continue, I will definitely do it. Just a dollar a day on the Patreon or whatever, if that's something you're interested in supporting and, and we'll go forward doing it. And the amount of support I saw was out of this world. Like I thought <laughs> that would be a fun way to kind of almost get to that goal. And I think it, I think it was like something like a hundred dollars. Uh, I do monthly on Patreon, mm. and I thought, yeah, that's that sounds pretty good. A hundred bucks buying games here and video cables, and and at one point a console that I didn't own at the time. Mm. So that that supported that, and the amount of support I saw, like people really wanted to see the other games in the RE series, the spinoffs and the mobile games, and you know the revelations and you know <laughs> your dead aims and stuff. <laughs> so I went through on eBay and bought every single Resident Evil game ever printed to a disc or a cartridge. <laughs> and I think as it is right now, um, other than the 3DS game, uh, Mercenaries 3D, uh -huh. and the Java-based cell phone games, I have touched <laughs> on every single RE game that has ever released. Oh, that's fantastic. That, pretty that is very impressive. <laughs> it it was a chore. It took me more than a year to finish the whole series, but it was so fun. I couldn't even tell you. It was just so cool. Oh, that's great. So do you have a favorite video in that entire retrospective that either you worked on behind the scenes or you were really happy with how it came out? Hmm. That's a good question. Oh, they're all so cool. Um, <laughs> I probably, I would say the most memorable, it's not my favorite. There were things I would have changed or, or done better if I would have mm. had maybe more time or, uh, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. Yeah. But I think the RE 1.5 video that I put out was m the most memorable because I had always seen footage on, on sites like Bioflames and mm. uh, like, you know, back when you had to dial into the internet on a 56K modem, <laughs> um, I used to watch, you know, little quick time clips of Resident Evil 1.5 and it just kind of hit me like I could just, I could play it. Like, you know, I could put it on my computer, or put, burn it to a disc and actually play the game. Yeah. And I started it up, I played it, and it was the most surreal experience actually playing through the front of the RPD with the shutters that didn't come down all the way and zombies crawling underneath them. I, I had seen videos of this when I was, <laughs> Jesus, I think 14, 15 years old. Yeah, and yeah. And now I was playing through it. And, it, you know, to this day, going through and playing through it, I used all the music that I would hear in those trailers in the video just to kind of give myself a little nostalgia boost. And <laughs> I still, to this day, go back and watch my own video on that because it's so <laughs> cool. <laughs> I think around that time that you released your 1.5 video, wasn't there, like, more footage or, like, more like gameplay, like actual playable uh, portions of the game that had come out around that time, or am I misremembering? Around that time, yes. Like, a, I think a half a year before I had made that video, I, I want to say it was the Magic Zombie Door had released a playable version that uh, strung a lot of the rooms together that had not been connected, because the uh, the game had released relatively complete, but it wasn't 
in a linear complete package so there were certain doors that just terminated didn't go anywhere yeah so what the these coders would do would go through and just you know put a to b and they would say okay well this room's supposed to lead here so it's referenced in the code this way and um they went through and finished a portion of it and they were able to code in some of the cutscenes with dialogue which before i don't think people could get a hold of mm. without using like command line or anything yeah so i was able to actually kind of relatively up to a certain point i think it was up to the sewer you could play through it as it was intended to be played as resident evil 1.5 with a few things missing but um yeah so it was, it was exciting that that was uh, out there and then there's another group that i think might still be working on a more uh like cohesive game type of situation for it because magic zombie doors is, is more patchwork than anything mm. but um yeah so i was it, it was it was interesting to be able to see that stuff and then finally i was you know on the cusp of them making it actually playable instead of loading into a room and shutting down the emulator and loading into another room uh this was actually you could kind of play it like a resident evil game which was <laughs> pretty insane at the time yeah, it's weird to be able to go back to what is essentially in your in your mind a new game of an old style of Resident Evil that they really don't do anymore. Yeah, exactly. So I would love to just like sit here and talk about Resident Evil all day with you because Jared <laughs> is the man. If if anybody wants to talk about Resident Evil, Jared knows what's up. I've got some opinions for sure. And he'll talk back to you too. You go to Twitter, he responds to all the comments, all that junk. That's a fact. Yep. <laughs> And Galen and I played the Resident Evil 5 constantly together, right, Galen? Uh, absolutely. Um, God, we beat that game to death. Mm. Those stupid medals. Those yeah. stupid medals. <laughs> so you want to hear something crazy? Um, I've never actually... I've, I've only played about 30 minutes of RE5 multiplayer. I've always only played it single player. <laughs> I don't know why. That's for, for really most games, mm -hmm. you could say that. Yeah. I... Uh, I don't know why. I just really like experiencing a game single, even if it's a game like RE5 with an AI partner that definitely should be controlled by someone else. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I played RE5 with my wife, and I was like, "Oh, this is pretty fun." But the second she was, you know, she's like, "Oh, I got to work late or whatever." I'm playing that game, so <laughs> 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 I think that's how it usually works out with multiplayer games in my household. So I always end up playing a lot of these games single player. And, uh, you know, Revelations 2 is the same way. So I, mm. that's why my videos are kind of interesting in the sense that I experience them sometimes a little different than most people may have. Mm. Mm. It, it would be interesting to see uh, if your opinion has changed at all going back and playing something like Resident Evil 5 purely from a multiplayer standpoint. That would be very interesting to see because, you know, and, and I might be an insane person, but the <laughs> only th I think I have only played through it three times like from start to finish uh -huh. and all three times i thought the ai was perfectly okay for sheva mm. like she she everybody's complaints were like oh it's terrible and then she uses all i gave sheva all of my healing items uh i gave her the machine gun and all of the automatic ammo and she was never an issue for me she killed people when she needed to i only died once because of her mm. throughout the entire playthrough which from what people tell me in the comment section is a rarity so I might just be lucky, I think. No, you know, I had a similar experience uh, to you playing in single player. She was perfectly mm. okay, I would say. That's a great yeah, way to describe exactly. it. Yeah, it, it wasn't amazing. Galen, what about you? Do you remember? I, I think the only time that I ever had a frustration when it came to dealing with the AI was during the last fight in Resident Evil 5. And just mm. specifically that part where Chris has to run up and punch the boulder or <laughs> Sheva has to run away uh from the tyrant and you're just like whoever the ai is is not doing a good enough job at what, what that is huh. yeah it's like i played a different game from everybody else it felt like. <laughs> <laughs> so you're currently working on uh some different stuff that's going to be coming up in the future what what stuff mm -hmm. have you been working on since your resident evil retrospective just to give everybody kind of an idea of what else you do you know, I really like the whole retrospective thing, so I tried to keep that going because I like the idea of taking a, a, a game that I like and seeing if it belongs to a bigger series and playing all those games. Mm. So I um, I think the obvious progression w was pretty clear. Uh, I went from Resident Evil to Dino Crisis, which makes it wasn't a large yeah. leap there. 
which was a good time. That was really fun because um, it had been years and years since I had played Dino Crisis 1, and I'd never played Dino Stalker, so it was a perfect fit. Mm. And uh, I try to throw in little single, you know, one-off reviews and stuff. Like you said, I did Brave Fencer Musashi, which was an absolute blast. So uh, good. Ring of Red. It's I love so that game good. so much. The voice <laughs> acting, everything about it. It's just, oh, that is late 90s. Squaresoft. Like, if you needed to point to a game to show someone what kind of games they released, it would be Brave Fencing Musashi. Yeah, we were talking about this last week. <laughs> have you ever played Samurai Legend Musashi? I have. I've never put enough time into it. I can remember um, rescuing uh, rescuing the... I, honestly, I want to say she was a princess. Is she not? I don't remember. But you're carrying her, and you can <laughs> throw her up in the air and then do attacks uh, mm-hmm. with her. And I remember getting back to that hub area um, that like circular kind of like city like hub area and I think I did one more mission after that and I can remember like a highway type situation with an overpass where you're fighting robots and that's the furthest I can remember it's been so long and I really want to go back and play it because the music is so good in that game <laughs> I can say that I went through the entire game and it with the writing and the second one just it killed it for me. <laughs> yeah, I can. Yeah, for sure. I think the the main character's voice actor probably could have been a little less annoying for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, in addition to some of those retrospectives that you do, you've been doing a ton of work on retro consoles and upscaling and getting the best quality image out of retro oh, yeah. consoles, right? Yeah, that's uh, become a little bit of. Uh, you know, some might call it an addiction, <laughs> maybe a little unhealthy. <laughs> yeah, I believe in Japanese they would call you a maniac. Maniac. Oh, <laughs> that sounds cool. I'll take that. <laughs> Maniac. <laughs> oh, perfect. All right. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's a pretty apt description. So you are a big proponent of the Frame Meister, which you mentioned just a little bit earlier. Can you tell us mm-hmm. what is the Frame Meister? Um, the Frame Meister. Uh, it exists on two realms. <laughs> uh, <laughs> technically, what you would call it is a black hole that you throw all your money into and it never comes back out. But uh, <laughs> realistically, it that is a about right. <laughs> yeah. It's a cool little device that will take old retro video and upscale it to modern HD resolutions, and it does it uh, in a sense where it's it's tailor made for um, old retro consoles used to output 240p, which is a very low progressive scan resolution. And this thing can intelligently interpret one pixel and turn it into four and then do that for an entire, it does it one frame at a time. That's why they call it the Frame Meister. Mm. Um, it is a really cool little box and it allows you to do a lot of really cool stuff. Once the video has been fed in, say from a, a PS1 or Super Nintendo, you can zoom the picture in because 240p technically, as far as an integer scale goes, which means an even scale, can only go up to 960p which would only fill a portion of your 1080p TV, but then you can zoom the picture or maybe uh, tweak sharpness or brightness, which is all stuff you'd probably have to do in your editing software once you were finished with a game. But now you can get a very pristine source file, you know, that looks very sharp and and colorful and you could tweak the the darkness and and the black levels and stuff. Um, It is a really, really cool little thing and requires a lot of learning, but I think (laughs) everyone should have one, honestly. Yeah, I've been so intrigued and especially like hearing your retro v- reviews and your videos. I'm always like, mm, I should get that Frame Meister. <laughs> you really should. <laughs> <laughs> My issue is that I'm not great at troubleshooting. I have a very short temper for that. That's why I'm not a PC gamer as much as I would right. like to be. There's just a very short fuse that I have for that. I, I can I can attest to this. <laughs> yeah, I can I can 100% hundred and ten percent understand that it does you know i myself uh this is gonna sound i said it in my mind it didn't make sense let's go ahead and put it out there i'm a tweaker um i like when i <laughs> <laughs> which you know you take that how you will but uh what i mean is um i've always been the i like to do a lot of work so that later i don't have to do any work right Mm. So um, I've always been interested in tech and I've worked in the home theater installation business for a long time and I've built Mm. PCs since I was probably a preteen. And so every time I'll start a game or start a movie on my home theater system, 
I'll look at it and I'll be like, oh, you know, is, is the brightness a little too high? I think the whites are getting washed out here, you know? My <laughs> wife cannot stand it. You know, and we'll start a movie and I'll be like, oh, this is a stereo track? No, we're not streaming this. We'll buy the Blu-ray, you know? <laughs> I've always been that kind of guy. So I think the Frame Meister will appeal to people who are also that type of guy. Um, okay. It is, it is kind of hard. There is a way that you can set up the Frame Meister where it's a set it and forget it type of deal, which mm-hmm. I've gotten to, luckily. But it has required a f- insane amount of money from me. So <laughs> uh, you can you can get it to that point to where you just set it and forget it. I'm at the point now where I have everything running through um, component video YPBPR, and I bought um, an Extron Crosspoint video switch, which is a it's a switch that can take in 12 inputs and output eight outputs simultaneously, which is absolute insanity. And I don't need <laughs> I just needed 12 inputs. Um, and I have it to where everything feeds into the component uh, input of the Frame Meister. And all I have to do is if I start up the SNES, I just hit the button on the cross point and then I tell the Frame Meister what settings. Um, you just go to the SNES preset, boom, you're good to go. Uh, it, that does take a little bit of work, but you could literally just go online, download profiles from uh, Firebrand X, and he's already went through and gotten pixel perfect settings. You just put those right in the frame meister on a micro SD card and you click on it, boom, you're good to go. Nice. Oh, that sounds so appealing. It's it's <laughs> it's much uh it's much less tweaking, which is really good. And then from there, if you want to, if you're playing it and you're like, ah, you know, this is a little soft, and adjust the bright you know, I've only ever had to bump sharpness up by one notch ever. Mm. So, you know, you're you're not gonna be in there forever. Just once you figure it out, you can just get it to the point where you press the the power button on your console and you're set to go you and galen both have that in common where you like to uh tweak with things i don't mm-hmm. know if galen has that exact end goal of uh trying to avoid too much work in the end i think galen just enjoys the moment of tweaking is that is that true <laughs> would you call yourself a tweaker galen i am definitely a tweaker yeah no, Fellow absolutely tweaker. <laughs> uh i remember when uh oni when you and i were doing super turbo fighters i got the footage back from the Resident Evil 2 remake and just kind of sitting here going, I can make this better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I told you, bro, like, the more you put into it, the more time it's going to take. Yeah, but I mean, once you figure out what settings you need to move, it's just like, okay, the game looks better with these filters applied to it, so mm-hmm. I'm just going to copy and paste these filters onto all of the videos in the series. Awesome. Yeah, <laughs> see, there you go. Yeah, that's that's what I've always enjoyed is is uh, I want to get to the point where I don't have to work. So that's going to require a lot of it's the idea of retirement, but with all of your free time, (laughs) (laughs) it's setting up a self-sustaining system. Yeah, no, it's it's super fun. That's that's, you know, I set up a home theater PC in here with uh, Xbox Media Center, which is now called Cody, which is a cool little like aggregate for all of your media files, your movies and TV shows. And mm-hmm. you have to tag them just the right way so you can scrape them on the internet and download all the episode information and all the images. And I watch oh. a lot of Japanese movies, which aren't in the database, so I have to provide my own description and images. And I must have spent a week solid <laughs> because I have, I have like, I think at the time I had six terabytes of movies and TV shows. I, I'm a big collector. I always collected things. Mm, yeah. So I have all these TV shows and movies. And uh, I we've talked about uh, Japanese dramas before. That just, you know, as far as uh, English, like, media scraping sites, they just don't have any of this stuff. So, uh, what was the big show that I was watching at the time? Raifu, which is really good, like, about <laughs> bullying and stuff. Yeah. Nobody knew anything about it, so I had to put in my own, and I downloaded pictures myself for the, you know, uh, the show art and the background when you're on that show. It. The whole point is, is I did that for about a week so that I never had to do it again, and I haven't touched it in years, and I'm in heaven. <laughs> That's awesome, though. Like, that's the kind of uh, legwork that so many people won't go through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that probably has, at the very least, contributed to me doing well on YouTube. Just being willing to put in a lot more work than anyone will ever notice. Mm -hmm. (laughs) No, I I know lots of people do notice it. And even if they're not noticing it consciously, subconsciously, uh, it's, Mm. you know, really helping your viewer base, I think. Well, that's why I have my fingers crossed for, because it is a lot of work, and hopefully, you know, sometimes I'll get the comment that goes, oh, I, I noticed how when you were talking about this, the footage was showing this thing, and it was just kind of ironic, and I'm like, oh, thank God, someone noticed. <laughs> <laughs>
So especially pertinent to our viewers, uh, you have done several different videos on like upscaling your Super Nintendo 64, GameCube, in addition to, right. of course, the PS1 and PS2. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about upscaling the Nintendo consoles in particular, or those videos that you've done on them at least? Um, you know, upscaling Nintendo consoles can be a bit of a a bit of an endeavor because Nintendo has not made it easy for people to go in and get really good video quality out of their consoles mm -hmm. past the Super Nintendo. Okay. So um for people who don't who don't know the Super Nintendo out of the box supported RGB video which is uh the closest thing to uncompressed video you can get out of uh the the analog realm. Okay. And it, the the way to think about it is this is how I like to imagine it at least. So your console is producing video internally inside of it and that is just an uncompressed digital picture inside the box now it has to be squeezed through that tiny little connector on the back of the box that goes to your TV so there has to be some compression there there's a conversion that takes place from digital to analog because for the longest time we only used analog video before HDMI mm -hmm. <laughs> so there had to be compression that took place at that jack and then it was shot out compressed to your TV and your TV decompressed it and shot it up to full screen. Mm. What uh, Nintendo has done is made it kind of, in a sense, harder to get a hold of that uncompressed video because the N64 didn't include RGB. The GameCube sort of did, but it was through component cables you could only get from Nintendo's website, which not a lot of people did. And now oh. you'll pay upwards of, I think it's the last time I saw, it was anywhere... From, between $180, $320 for a pair of GameCube component cables. Oh my god. Yeah, it's pretty insane. You had yeah. to you had to physically buy it off of their website. And I think at the time it was only it was less than sixty dollars on the website, which oh man, if I could go back in time with like a credit card, I would be a rich man now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so that was pretty interesting. With the N64, they just axed it all, and they're like, "No, nah, you're getting S video, and that's all you're gonna get, and you'll be mm. happy with it." So um, there's been workarounds that's been done. Uh, a lot of the first uh, batch of 64s that were released, they had the ability to do RGB video. There was just there weren't the proper connections on the video connector, so you could technically plug in a Super Nintendo RGB cable because they used the same connector type. Uh, you just wouldn't get a picture because the lines weren't connected um, on the actual analog connector. So you can go in, which was what I did recently. It's a pretty interesting little mod. You just take a few capacitors off the board that are on the R, G, and B lines. And you put in a little amp, which will amplify the red, green, and blue signals coming off the board. And you literally just slot it right in to where the analog video connector goes. You only <laughs> have to solder. I think it was five wires to the board and pretty easy to get two locations. And then boom, I had just pristine 240p RGB, nearly uncompressed analog video coming out of it. Uh, and it took me, I mean, obviously they would have, you know, had a better deal than me. I paid $30 for an RGB amp. It would have cost them <laughs> 16 cents to include it inside the N64. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so Nintendo consoles have always been a bane to me because uh, there's so many games, like, for example, on the GameCube, the Resident Evil remake, which is one of my favorite games of all time. Yeah, and for me the too. longest time. Yeah, it's just, it was incredible. I pre ordered a GameCube specifically for that game <laughs> and I never looked back. That was like the best purchase I ever made. Yeah. But I've only ever been able to play S video on those consoles. And when you start getting into higher quality video signals out of retro consoles, S video starts to not cut it anymore. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. I remember playing it on like a tiny little uh, TV just because, you know, we had crappy TVs uh, mm -hmm. during the GameCube era. And, mm -hmm. oh, God, what were those cables called? It would it would connect directly to the cable connector in the back of a TV. The component cables? Is, is that R the component cable? I thought the component cable is yeah. the RGB one, though, right? Component cables are the red, green, blue, and then yeah. the red and white cables. Mm. Uh, there's composite, which was the yellow, and then the stereo audio, red and white. And what you might be thinking of is RF, where it screws into the back of the little screw joint on the back that's of the TV. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's RF. That is literally, and not not judging you here, but <laughs> that is the worst quality video you can get uh, oh, yeah. here in the United States of America. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's basically what I was working with on like a tiny, Oof. awful TV. And that's how I would that's play rough. and speed run Resident Evil Remake. Ooh, That was the only game I ever speed run. 
Uh, you know, that's a, that's a fun game to start speedrunning with, that's for sure. The Resident Evil games just play so well into that speedrunning mentality. It's, it's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, and there's even, like, rewards for it, right? You know, the Infinity lo mm -hmm. Rocket Launcher and everything, so yeah. you're already just halfway there. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's really interesting to hear about all of this, like, wealth of knowledge that you have on upscaling the retro consoles, and you have videos on all of these different consoles on your YouTube, right? Yeah, and, and products like um, Eon, who's been super nice. They've always reached out to me. When mm -hmm. they found that I was such a, a fan of the retro uh, video stuff, they sent me products, things like the GameCube HDMI adapter, which, like I was saying, uh, for the longest time, all we had was S-Video, unless you wanted to spend 350 bucks on component cables. But they built an HDMI adapter that would communicate with a proprietary port on the back of your, your launch-era GameCubes mm -hmm. that provided just... Uh, that digital, that lossless digital picture inside the console I was talking about, that's the first time we've ever had access to it, which is really cool. So I've, I've gotten lucky enough to where I could review a bunch of products like the N64 HDMI adapter, and I don't know, it's, it's been a crazy ride with this retro video stuff. It's, it's become a past an obsession at this point. <laughs> That's great. So if any of our listeners want to just get into the game, there is a whole but not no pun intended. My God, I can't believe I just said that. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole bunch of really good entry level information in those videos that Jared has on his YouTube avalanche reviews. And I have several of them saved, actually, because I'm like, you know what? Jared is going to be my catalyst on this. That's how I'm going to get into this. So I have those videos saved for whenever I end up having extra cash or the extra time or whatever to get going on upscaling my old consoles you just you just put your your hand in mine i will, I will lead you through that valley i promise <laughs> <laughs> as long as we can skip through the valley i'd be fine with it that, that's absolutely doable <laughs> <laughs> so i guess i also wanted to ask you about being a youtuber about you know kind of the the struggles of being a smaller content creator and especially with a lot of the changes that youtube has made where mm. it's getting even harder for people to see your content especially for the smaller guys so i wanted to ask you a bit about that and if you've run into any troubles with like the streaming platform that well not even platform but like the streaming avenue that mm. youtube is really trying to push lately i 100 percent have and um it seems to be uh which is one of the few times where it's not local to just small-time content creators. Uh, it seems to be a site-wide thing. I, I, I started streaming around the release of the RE2 remake because I found out about the RE2 remake first-person mod, which was out of this world. And I was <laughs> like, yeah, you know what? Let's, you know, I've been scared to stream because I didn't know how to do it. Mm. And I tend to be a little hyper-insane about figuring out every little thing before I do something. So I was pretty worried, but you know, all right, fine. This is the time to do it. I jumped in and the stream went really well and it ended up being so fun that I just started streaming um, a pretty good amount, like, you know, twice a week, it seemed like. But uh, apparently uh, YouTube <laughs> did not want me to do that. My channel growth started to tank real bad for a while and I really didn't, I never put two and two together because it didn't make any sense why one would affect the other. So I put out a tweet uh, one day just because it had been such a, a mass. You know, sometimes YouTube goes through these little hiccups where everybody will notice their channels aren't growing and then boom, out of nowhere, everything goes back to normal. Mm. So I figured, <laughs> you know, let's let's see what other content creators think. And I put a tweet out, you know, has anybody else noticed their channel kind of uh, dying off a little bit as far as views and monthly sub growth? And a buddy of mine, Mike Tendo, who... Uh, Oh, yeah. Who runs the show on YouTube, dude, you haven't played this game yet. He he tweeted on it, and he was like, oh, it's because you're streaming. It was so nonchalant. And I was like, wait, hold, what? You need to explain that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So I went down the rabbit hole, and this is a lot of information that really isn't uh, surface level available to a lot of people. You have to do some digging like I did. Mm -hmm. I found a Twitter thread of YouTubers much bigger than me who were having the same issues, which... You know, makes me feel good. At least, you know, I'm not the only person going crazy here. Or at the very least, my content isn't so bad that people are dropping off of it in record numbers. <laughs> but um, it was pretty insane. I had pretty much averaged, uh, you know, relatively 500 subscribers per every 30 days. When you go to your YouTube analytics, they can track it. And I, I saw it trending downwards and I had dipped below, you know, sub 200 subscribers 
which to a lot of smaller channels would be killer. But for me, it was like, ah, you know, that's that's a big jump. A lot yeah. of these uh, these YouTubers that were bigger than me said, well, when I started streaming, I noticed this. And I'm like, wait a minute, I'm streaming. And apparently, just streaming on the platform, if you already have, like if you're streaming from your channel where you do content that isn't streaming centered, Mm-hmm. It seems to kill growth and having your archive streams on your channel also for some reason seems to just demolish growth. You know, I, I was a little nervous about it because I liked having my archive streams up there because, you know, we had so much fun streaming and cool conversations and stuff. But I was like, oh, you know, it's the channel or streaming. So I deleted all my archives and I stopped live streaming and the change was I mean, as close to night and day as you can get on the internet. I think it took wow. four days, and I jumped from... I, no, it was six days in total. So I, I kept an eye on it for six days. It was sub-200 uh, subscribers per month. I am currently at 863 subscribers per month, and it's been steady for the last month. Wow. That is yeah. That was a six-day difference. Yeah. It was it was absolute insanity. I At first, I thought it was a coincidence, but... Going back and reading those threads, every single person on that Twitter thread goes, oh, yeah, just ax all your archives, stop live streaming, you'll see it work. And it, that's exactly what it did. It was pretty insane to see. That's fascinating because obviously YouTube is under a lot of pressure from Twitter, right, in terms of like mm-hmm. the gaming uh subsect of, of their users and viewers. Right. So they are trying to push YouTube streaming, right? Yeah. But if do, do you mean Twitter or Twitch? Twitch, yeah, that's what. Do you mean Twitter or Twitter? Twitch? Oh Jesus! <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. They they both start with a twi. It's whatever. <laughs> Twi. <laughs> so Twitch, Twitch streaming, right? YouTube streaming. Right. So YouTube wants to push that. Well, you yeah you you're you're on the right track. You would figure that they would want to incentivize streaming. Mm-hmm. There we go. Uh, versus what's actually happening, and I think this is the closest I can figure. And this hasn't been supported by any, you know, it's so hard to get information from YouTube. Absolutely. And, you know, sometimes you can understand why, because when they started releasing um, statistics about how they tweak their algorithm, people started taking advantage of it, obviously. So, yeah. yeah, you know, when they said, oh, you know, we look for videos in 10 minutes, people had just a black screen to fill out the 10 minute space on their videos for a while towards the end you know what I mean which is just yeah. I can see why they wouldn't share information with us sometimes mm-hmm. but this is the best I can figure with the limited information that I have YouTube is probably seeing that I'm putting out four hour streams and it's assuming okay well this is the content he provides because it would take me you know four months to have four hours worth of content that I upload to YouTube with my normal videos mm-hmm. so I assume YouTube's thinking oh okay this guy's a streamer now we'll pump all of his stuff out to people who watch streams which i think make up a smaller demographic than people who watch watch a long form video game analysis videos i so i think maybe it stopped shooting my videos out to people who are interested in video games and started shooting my videos out who are interested to not only streaming but the smaller sect of video game streaming Mm -hmm. and that's that's the closest thing i can figure that that could be going on here yeah that's frustrating it's like such a mystery right because they don't divulge enough information to creators mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yep and, and and you can kind of understand why but it, at the same time when it's your job it, it would be nice to know the information needed to do it properly yeah yeah what i've seen a lot of other content creators do is they actually create when they are interested in streaming uh creating a completely separate channel just for their stream itself yeah which i kind of um i would like to get back into because i i I've been streaming on Twitch for a little bit, and I will say it is interesting, and I like the community, but streaming on YouTube just for some reason just felt so much more convenient to me. There's mm-hmm. something about it. When people wanted to super chat, it's baked right into the uh, comment uh, section there. So, you know, it just seemed like a more convenient platform. I, I am thinking about, you know, I would feel like a jerk because I built up this this audience on Twitch and I got affiliate <laughs> like status which is really cool and then i don't like it as much as youtube looking back on it and i don't want to be one of those people who uses like restream or something to stream to two different platforms so like when you're in the comment section you see people i'm talking to people who don't exist as far as you're concerned Mm -hmm. oh that sucks 
Yeah, so I, I don't want to do that either. I might just leave YouTube alone for now, just because I'm, I'm already on Twitch, and who knows when YouTube is going to make another rule that's going to be absolutely ridiculous and ruin my growth for that. <laughs> so maybe I'll keep them quarantined for now, but I would prefer streaming on YouTube, honestly. <laughs> mm-hmm. No matter what happens, I'll still be having fun. So, you know, that's always a good thing. Yeah. So where can people find you on Twitch, speaking of this? Uh, Twitch, my name is the same as YouTube, which is Avalanche Reviews. Um, I think I'm the only Avalanche Reviews when you search that. I'm almost positive. <laughs> but uh, I do try to... I stream every Friday, no matter what. But I also, randomly, if I get bored and I'm not working on a video, we'll play some RE4 or something. So actually, nice. when I'm done with this, I'll be streaming over there on Twitch. Nice. <laughs> that was great stuff about the uh, retro consoles and shit. Oh, man. you have I've, I've given you a 0.1% of the knowledge that's stuck in my <laughs> head right now. Oh, one day I need to just find a, a coma patient and just sit there and tell them about <laughs> retro video upscaling. I'll spend about, you know, four days and then we'll be good. And then they'll, like, wake up out of their coma, like, you know, five years later, and then they're going to be like, oh, I know all about this thing or whatever. I need to upscale video now. <laughs> Someone hand me some RGB components. <laughs> oh, it's 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 a such a rabbit hole you fall into because it's not just getting the frame meister. Well, then you're not, you have to buy the cables, too, to plug into it. But what cables do you get? Oh, okay, mm. so C-Sync. Well, what's, what's Sync? <laughs> Oh, damn, now I know what sync is. Well, okay, so what's sync regeneration? Oh, I'm going to need a switch. I have more than one console now, right? So I'm going to need a video switch. Well, what kind of switch works with RGB? Oh, damn it, well, I can convert <laughs> RGB. This is how it goes. It's <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if anybody out there wants to pick Jared's brain on this, he has a wealth of knowledge. So do check him out on Twitter, which is probably your, your talkie platform. Is that right? For sure, yeah. I mean, I... I'm lucky at the point now where I'm I'm growing, but I'm small enough that I can respond to every single DM or tweet that I get, which yeah. is really cool. Uh, you know what I find a lot on Twitter? Um, I get a lot of questions about fitness more than uh, retro upscaling. I do have people <laughs> come to me and ask me, you know, what's the best intro into it, blah, blah, blah. But I get a lot of people saying, hey, I saw that picture of you running three miles. Hey, how can I get into the gym or something? <laughs> so I've been given a lot of advice with upscaling and working out. So if you have any of those two needs uh, over at, uh, at Avalanche, J-A-R-E-D, Avalanche Jared, uh, I can be a little bit of help at the very least. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, you should think about combining some sort of like Resident Evil workout or something like that, right? <laughs> How amazing would that be? <laughs> Three mile zombie runs. That's all it is. <laughs> yeah, I could. You know what I could do is just run diagonally into a wall and move along it for hours on end. Just make it real true to the RE. <laughs> feeling. Uh, yeah, but you're gonna have to uh, make your elbows a little more pointy. Yeah, I, I could probably work that out. We can do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I had something else I was gonna say. I totally forgot. That's pretty much how it is writing a script for a YouTube review, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you need to say that about 30 times. I, I write out the full script in its entirety, how, it, the, how the end product is going to be, I, I do from the start. It's because I have to, I think of everything in a linear fashion, and I've set up uh, an order for how, you know, I always cover story, gameplay, graphics um, yeah. in all my videos. Which is weird because for me it goes graphics, gameplay, story as far as orders of importance. <laughs> but for some reason that's just how I started my scripts and now that's how I have to make them. So I can't work on the gameplay version first. Like let's say I haven't finished the story yet but I have a good idea of the gameplay. I can't start my script. I have to start with story. Um, so and I'll write it out and then I'll go, ah, oh, damn it. What was that thing? I, oh, I forgot it. Whatever. And then someone will make a comment. Hey, why didn't you talk about that intro song? God damn. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny that you say that also your, your hierarchy is probably graphics, gameplay, story. For me, mm. I think it's actually the opposite story, gameplay, graphics. Yeah. Well, recently the graphics are more, uh, you know, I probably shouldn't call it graphics anymore. I should call it, uh, like, video output at this point. Uh-huh, Because um, uh -huh. that's what I'm more interested in than the graphics. Because I'm playing, you know, old PS1 games, objectively. Not the most graphically capable games. 
but it's it's the quirks of the video output and mm. when you're playing a full 3d game like i'm playing through silent hill one right now and you see affine texture warping like that's something i'm going to mention for sure and not so much like oh this is a good looking game more like oh did you know that they used every other pixel style dithering to um fake a higher color depth than the console was capable of with full 3d and the ah. affine texture warping was masked and then you know stuff like that is what i really get into not so much um oh they use like bloom lighting or whatever you know mm -hmm. that's the stuff that i find most interesting but the stuff that makes me play the game we're just just story and that's it i'll play a bad game that controls terribly as long as the story is amazing yeah yeah same here <laughs> Uh, that's also really fascinating too, like that you talk about those kinds of details on a very technical level and uh, not just like a base level that everybody kind of, you know, they they he hear bloom lighting or right. know, texture mapping or something like that. And they're like, oh, well, I'm I'm in the know, just like somebody who like walks into a tattoo shop and they're like, hey, I'm going to get a sleeve like I'm in the know, <laughs> yeah. that kind of thing. Exactly. <laughs> so I always appreciate when you go into those details in your analysis videos because as somebody who doesn't know about that stuff, you explain it in a really um, consumable manner. See, that's I that was my biggest worry when talking about very technical subjects. Is that's my hope? As I explain this in a way that if you don't know what affine texture warping is, along with my you know visual context on screen at the moment, that I can give you the idea of what it is and without going into crazy technical details like because geometry couldn't be predicted at every possible perspective on the ps1 that's why it exists is because it couldn't do the math to properly predict uh how it was uh, like a 3d surface would look from this angle versus that one so they approximate it which is where the warping comes in um without having to explain that in the video and just showing the warping zooming in on it and then saying oh the affine texture warping in ps1 games blah 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 that's what i hope is i can give you a shotgun blast of information that you can take through and then by the time I'm done talking about it you've figured it out kind of on your own versus me telling you every detail that's great see you're gonna be a great teacher too oh I hope so because I've never done it before and uh, it's gonna be really <laughs> weird so let's jump on over to some of the news for this week we're boiling it down boiling it down like it's a red green and blue herb and we're turning it into just one item <laughs> <laughs> well done nicely done <laughs> Do they boil? Well, they... you know, whatever you do. I don't know. Ask Rebecca. Yeah. I always thought it was yeah, like that, grinding. That was a question on Twitter <laughs> that interested me. Like, what do you think they did? Because everybody always assumed they mix it up and like rubbed it on their wounds. But other people are like, did they eat it? Like, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Clearly, it's some high level shit because Billy does not know how to do it. That's a fact. <laughs> So the first thing I definitely wanted to talk about with the news is Astral Chain. This game comes out next week on the Nintendo Switch. I am incredibly hyped for this game. Astral Chain is this fast-paced, synergetic action game made by Platinum Games, directed by the game designer uh, Nier Automata and Wonderful 101. Galen, have you checked out any of this uh, Gamescom footage that we've seen in the past week? And what are your impressions of Astral Chain so far? Um, I started to watch the video that they came out with, uh, I believe a couple of days ago. I didn't get a chance to watch the entire thing. It looks good. Um, I was a little hesitant about the the actual gameplay or the action portions of it. I mean, if Latin you say games... literally anything bad about this game, I will fight you. <laughs> <laughs> but no, please be honest. Go ahead. I, I was worried that it was going to be a little overwhelming controlling your... Uh, your oh god what are they called i'm drawing a complete blank right now shoot stands <laughs> jojo yeah. stands i mean <laughs> legions <laughs> controlling your legion around and uh, fighting at the same time like was it you were just basically moving your character but you were fighting more through uh the stand or what exactly was going on uh that was cleared up to me uh watching the bit of the like the not i guess it was a developer interview the developer was there yeah tower of is there yeah uh no it it looks very exciting it looks very action paced and i really am very excited to see more of this game are you gonna pick it up uh i will probably rent it to start with i'm punching you the next time i see you <laughs> <laughs> Here's, here's my question. Where are you renting stuff at? Are you just doing, what, like Redbox? Like, is there an actual Blockbuster near you? 
Oh, he's got a great store. Tell him about it. <laughs> yeah, so there is a movie rental chain over by me called Family Video. And no it, way, Family Video still exists. No they, way. <laughs> they exist, and they have <sighs> gotten by by combining themselves with other franchises. Because I've got like four in the uh, nearby vicinity of me. One of them is combined with a pizza place. So it's wow. video rentals and pizza. And then the other one is a video rental place plus CBD dispensary plus oh, so that's Mexican restaurant. Okay, so you cover really all your bases there. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> the sign outside of that family video, it literally says CBD plus DVD equals good vibes. <laughs> Jeez, I mean, they're not wrong. <laughs> like It's good marketing. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Well, man, you are lucky. I haven't seen a family video since I used to live in uh, Tennessee. And there was family mm. video there and mm-hmm. Alabama. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah, oh, I'm yeah. super jealous. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to mention the uh, stands, which are called legions in this game. We should probably just call them proper, but whatever. I'll, yeah. I do what I want here on the Nintendo Everything podcast. Uh, these uh, stands remind me so much, and I know, Jared, you have to know about this game, of Chaos Legion for the PS2. You ever play that? Mm-hmm. You now, here's the crazy thing. I could literally describe to you the DVD, like the case art of Chaos Legion. I've never actually played it, but that protagonist with his like red hair, and I think it's like a white <laughs> coat, right? Like, I, I remember so much about that game. Something about the yeah. PS2 era. Those games were so around me, and I've had it for a while. I've just never played it. But for oh. some reason, like PS2, like DVD case art, like I'm super familiar with even games I never touched. Hmm. Yeah, they were so striking, like very, very Japanese. Like the PS2 mm-hmm. was like the last hurrah of Japanese game development, right? There was it's so true. much like cool Japanese kind of stuff happening. That's why we got like Dante from Devil May Cry and stuff. Yeah, it's, it's you know what it was, is it was the, like you said, the last hurrah for Japanese game development and it a combination of that and... 3D being relatively expensive to produce, but not mm-hmm. as expensive as it would become. So you got a lot of uh, middle market titles, whereas once the 360 came out, uh, two years into the 360's life cycle, we pretty much axed all middle market titles at that point. Yeah. So that's that you were able to see uh, very experimental, weird games that didn't exactly pay off financially, but like created a lot of gameplay systems that we would see becoming popular later on pretty cool stuff yeah right right that's like perfect insight that's exactly why i loved those generations and then in the ps360 and wii era i like barely gamed at all like the Mm -hmm. games that were coming out were just kind of not for me yeah plus i was super depressed in college and being like oh my god money and all that oh that'll (laughs) do it for sure (laughs) so getting back to astral chain this is definitely my most hyped video game of the year I mean, considering Resident Evil 2 Remake already came out earlier in the year, so this is the game for me right now. (laughs) There you go. It looks really interesting from what I'm seeing. Like, it, it, you know, my... Okay, so with a game like this that has such fluid action, and it looks like it really does have some really dope action, I just, I can't foresee the world being incredibly engaging in a world. Now, keeping in mind, I I haven't played near... Was it Automata? Yeah. Automata? Whichever, yeah, I've, I've heard it pronounced either way. Um, <laughs> I haven't played that, so if that's the perfect example of how this can be done right, then I, I wouldn't know about it. But it seems like most games like this that have this really great combat tend to fall into the Devil May Cry hole, which is having arena-based stuff where you run along a linear line and then there's a big wide open space that you know a fight's coming in. And yeah. that just keeps happening throughout the entire game, which I do love Devil May Cry, but... You know, I've become so jaded in my old age where I want my games to just have like a like a really engaging world. The way that I imagined FF7 was in my brain um, uh-huh. as a kid. That's what I want out of video games, which is weird to expect stuff <laughs> like that. But um, yeah, I'm just I'm so picky with this kind of stuff. But the, the action and the style looks just right up my alley, though. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, I also have... I'm trying to set my sights a little bit low in terms of the level design for the game. It seems like it's set in like one big world, kind of like a Midgar, just keeping with the Final Fantasy VII theme. Right, right. Yeah. And then you're also jumping into the alternate dimension, the Isekai, if you will. And that's where a lot of the more, I think, adventurous puzzle 
solving and uh, level design is going to take place. I'm trying to think of it as like a step above Bayonetta where it's not really corridors, but it's also not something like a big open world like Nier Automata. So right. trying, to, trying to stage my, my expectations in a, a good level. You know, I'm I'm an expert at just having low expectations for games and ending up enjoying them. So this could be the one. <laughs> yeah, check out his Trash Classics uh, series on YouTube. That's what that's totally about. Exactly. Um, I'm kind of in the same thought process as you when it comes to how the game is going to be devised as far as like action gameplay versus exploratory gameplay. Yeah. I think it is going to be a little bit more on the linear side. Uh, for how you are receiving those little bits of non-gameplay information, like the story and the world building and things like that. So, I am interested to see that they have maybe smaller areas that are not so big or not as explorative as an open world game, but there are some puzzles. So, for example, I saw in the footage that you were like going after a like a lead. By using your legion to pick up on the guy's scent. So you're using your beast legion, and then your beast takes you to a big door that the beast can't get to. And then he's pawing at the door like he's like a little dog that's gotta go outside and take a shit. It's so cute. <laughs> but then you switch your legion to like your big hulking brawler that's got the huge arms, and then he busts open the iron door. And then that's how you progress. And mm. I like those little kind of puzzles. That actually reminds me of like Lufia back on the Super Nintendo where you use your tools. Yeah. So I, if it's that kind of stuff, I'm cool with it. And then moving on, we have kind of an interesting thing. We've been seeing so much gameplay of The Witcher 3 on Nintendo Switch. This is a game that a lot of people were like, how is this actually going to work? Like, isn't it going to look like absolute garbage on the Switch? And now that we're getting some gameplay out of it, well, before I start talking about it, let's let's take it over to Mr. Graphics Gameplay Story over here, Jared. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts when you see the the output of the Switch um, okay, so I'm of two minds. Yeah. On one side, it's really awesome to see the kind of work that people do to get uh, games like that running on hardware that just cannot handle that, that level of graphical fidelity. Mm -hmm. Like, that's really interesting to me. Like, for example, you're not going to be able to just down-res it, right? Because there's a lot of graphical stuff going on, post-processing stuff, and, and visual effects and particle effects that maybe would just, you know, tank the processor and the GPU on a Switch. That yeah. part of it is really interesting for me. Um, as you might know, I have a, a tentative uh, history with the Nintendo Switch, which uh, teeter-totters between uh, genuinely <laughs> hoping that it was better and uh, trash-talking it on my YouTube videos and getting, like, a lot of hate and that becoming, like, <laughs> sort of a meme in itself. And uh, You just do that to fan the flames. You're just a gaslighter. Oh, I do, without a doubt. Yeah, because it's fun. It's, it's, it's so fun. And it's become such a thing that people expect out of me that I just kind of have to at this point. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm the type of person who appreciates any game hardware. Uh, the Switch, I felt like, because Nintendo is such a big company, could have been better. And my, my biggest gripe with Nintendo, outside of aping video quality on purpose with their old stuff, um, <laughs> I... I I don't like how ever since the Wii, they felt like they need a gimmick with every console. When mm -hmm. back in the day, the gimmick used to be, this played really, really cool games. Uh, now the gimmick has to be, oh, it's portable and a home console, and it has detachable controllers, and it, somebody should have stopped their R&D department like halfway through and go, you've given enough good ideas, let's keep the rest <laughs> for a future console. This does not have to be the everything box. Yeah, um, yeah. So I do have... I wouldn't say a negative opinion of the Switch. I wished it was better because I wanted something for PS, uh, for Sony and, and for Microsoft to have to compete with. And I don't think mm. there's any competition because Nintendo keeps eking out its own little niche, which is good in the short run, but that's very bad business in the long run. Like, they need to be competitive in the overall gaming market. Mm. I, you could argue probably that that's pretty helpful as well. I think mm. there's a good argument either way, which is... I love having arguments, so that's good. Yeah. Which yeah, leads yeah. with that long, drawn-out explanation. Uh, Witcher 3, eh, it looks kind of okay. <laughs> 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 it doesn't look terrible. It doesn't look as bad as I thought it would. I will say, yeah, um, yeah. for me, graphics aren't as important as smooth gameplay. And uh -huh. it looks like they are going to be chugging frames in a lot of the major areas. Like, I think the play is it gr not Groznygrad. Is that the area? 
I forgot. There's one really famous town, right? Yeah, that's the one that we always use for PC benchmarking and stuff. I, I watch a lot of tech reviews, too. Yeah, the PS4, I remember, chugged that area. If they have made changes to where uh, real crucial stuff like combat is relatively smooth most of the time, then I'll give it, you know, the old Avalanche Reviews thumbs up of approval. But <laughs> I think the frame rate really is going to be what tanks it and not so much the downgraded graphics. Because as someone who liked a game on the Vita, I'm used to getting those inferior versions of games just to play mm. on the go. It's, just, it's, yeah. it's the frame rate that I'm, I'm worried about. Well, and here's my big question over everything. Does it still play Gwent? That's all I yes, want to Yes, it does. Well, there you go. I'm ha I'm happy with it. <laughs> <laughs> so I might be a little bit of a, a Witcher noob, right? Because I've only ever played The Witcher 2. But here, I, I've never played 3, but um, I've done the husband thing and watched my wife play through all of 3. And I could say uh, not enough Triss Marigold for me to even consider buying on the Switch. I'll say that just straight <laughs> up front. <laughs> Yeah, she's, she's a great character. the ultimate waifu. She's the best. She's such a cool character. And then I'm watching her play The Witcher 3, and I'm like, where is Triss during all of this? Yeah. <laughs> That's my whole question. So I am I think I'm actually in a lot of agreement with you on this, Jared, um, except I think in terms of uh, the Switch, you know, going after sort of its own market and being a bit of a red mage on things, where it's, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. Um I, I think that it's working out for Nintendo. I have a, a more positive, uh, I guess, response to how it's worked out for Nintendo. I have mm -hmm. I was not a fan of the Wii at all. Uh, with the Wii U, I actually preferred that over the Wii just because there was at least a controller with it. <laughs> you know, right, like right. at least the the gamepad had its thing. But uh, I agree with you that like the Switch kind of does too many different things. And I would like to see it focus on other things. It's mm -hmm. a really weird time for Nintendo, and I think that the Switch was a like direct response to the Wii U and the Wii. So Yeah, I will say I'm happy that it was successful. That's Me a too, lot of times sure. um people tend to misconstrue my criticisms with like Nintendo hate, which you know, is fun to joke around about, but in in reality yeah. some of my favorite RPGs of all time were on the Super Nintendo and then you had the Resident mm -hmm. Evil remake, which we all agree is the best game ever made. All time. Um, that was on the GameCube. It's game the only Cube. game you ever need. Yeah, it's the only one. <laughs> um, so I, I'm nowhere near uh, someone who hates Nintendo, but I do mm. criticize them a lot for their business practices, uh, mm. starting with the Wii. I used to just be, oh yeah, they put out another console, cool. And then I saw the Wii getting popular, and I remember, even you know, I bought one day one. So it's not like I wasn't part of the problem, but I remember oh, thinking wow. to myself, like, this seems like it could be a problem coming down the line. Um <laughs> They're doing really well with this in a market of people who don't play video games. I sure hope they don't end up trying to only market to people who don't play video games. You know, yeah. which is cue the uh, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia title screen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the gang ditches traditional video game development. <laughs> yeah, so that ended up happening. And I started kind of noticing little things that Nintendo was doing. And I noticed every single console had a quirk. And I'm like, you could just, maybe the quirk is you make a really solid game console next time. That you don't have so many. Because a lot of times, the quirks ended up coming at the cost yeah. of hardware. And, you know, with the Switch, okay, so you, you make a console that's both portable and a uh, home console. Maybe... How, and this is the okay so I might get off on a rant here I'm sorry if this ends up going four hours over so <laughs> when the when the switch was first teased and they had that teaser trailer with just like uh, the random assortment of, of young hipster people using it in different scenarios yeah remember, Karen yeah I was I was analyzing that video because we had no information at the time and it's when I famously made my the Nintendo switch is likely to fail video which proved itself wrong a million times. Um, oh. But in, in that video, I, I, I really did. I, I predicted that it would fail based on my knowledge of the industry and my knowledge on a very technical level of the hardware that would probably go into it. So I will take my lumps in the, in the case that I was wrong that it wasn't going to fail. Uh, I do like to back up on. I did say likely. <laughs> I didn't say definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what I did at the time, which is I, if I had to pat myself on the back for anything, it's the fact that I accurately predicted almost every single piece of tech that went into that console before we mm. had any information and before anybody was speculating. I knew that it was going to use a Tegra process, uh, GPU. 
and yeah. I knew around about the clock speeds that it was going to be down clock to. I knew it wasn't going to operate at the same speed as an Nvidia Shield, but I knew mm-hmm. it was going to be new silicon versed on what was or, uh, based on what was in there. I also knew that it was going to have pretty poor active cooling based on the thinness. And what I did was is I took a picture of in that tra- that little teaser video where you can see it at a, a upwards angle. And I noticed, uh, okay, well, there's the 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. And I just superimposed that to see how uh, wide it was. And my m- unit of measurement was, it seems to be around two and a half to three 3.5 millimeter headphone jacks wide, which means it's going to have pretty poor active cooling because you can't mm. throw a fan and that kind of stuff. So we're probably mm-hmm. looking at vapor chambers, right? I accurately predicted a large portion of this thing. I predicted it wasn't going to have a super high res screen. I was thinking sub 1080p. Once again, yeah. right? I also predicted there was probably going to be no uh, active electronics inside the dock. I was assuming this was just going to be a straight digital to digital pass through type of situation and yeah, then a charging yeah. circuit, and that's it. And I was correct about that. So that's good. Uh, the only thing I wasn't correct about is um, Nintendo fans enjoying the console. I assumed, <laughs> based on everything that I knew, that while Nintendo had gotten away with uh, putting out hardware that did not compete, uh, technically speaking in the gaming market before Mm. that we were at a situation where they might not be able to financially do that anymore um i did not predict that they would have so many good first party games which if we go back and look at the gamecube wasn't the case as far i mean the switch now has really great first party games uh, but if you go back look at their other consoles the output wasn't exactly so hardcore and i think Mm -hmm. they probably understand that listen we've run this into the ground we can no longer compete with anyone uh, with the consoles we're putting out we have to ramp up first party games which is probably why we're starting to see metroids come back out again and stuff yeah i i don't know i i have a negative opinion of nintendo refusing to compete and only choosing to stay within their own niche because what they're doing is is forcing us into this duality of sony and microsoft who have refused to compete with each other for financial reasons we needed that wild card to jump in there and for Nintendo to go, nope, we're throwing something in the in the hoop and now you guys are going to have to be forced to improve because of us. Mm. That's what I was hoping for. Mm. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. And, you know, as you were talking about this just now, I was like, man, this is why I love Jared's channel and his content because regardless of whether I agree with you or disagree with you on so many different things, you always give such an insightful opinion and such a like detailed look into something. You're not just like, oh, it's stupid. It, it sucks. I don't like it because it's not <laughs> going to be the best of both worlds or it's not going to be you know really good at one thing. Like you, you're just into it and it's fantastic. Yeah. Well, you know where that comes from is constant tearing down my own ideas and opinions about things and building them back. I argue with myself a lot. Uh, uh, okay. You, you've seen me on Twitter and you know that... Uh, Twitter for me is like 85% arguments and 20% Resident Evil memes. <laughs> <laughs> but I enjoy, uh, I'm, I'm not like a lot of people on the internet where I argue to yell and get upset and angry. I really do like testing my opinions and sometimes there comes a, a point where I didn't consider that aspect of the argument and it, you know, at the very worst I come away with an opinion that is more correct or I've strengthened the one that I already have. And I've been arguing with Nintendo fans a lot over the Switch, so it's not so (laughs) much that I'm really smart and I've thought this through, but this is just a steel that has been tempered many times in use. (laughs) Like a katana. Like a really shitty katana. We we just fold this steel (laughs) over and over again until it's a a pretty decent (laughs) opinion. Yeah, there you go, you got it. (laughs) But, you know, I would say that they're not so much arguments as they are just like good discussions because i think Mm. argument conjures up a lot of people thinking it's just you know shouting opinions back and forth at each other you genuinely listen to other people like i remember you and i had uh i remember we were talking about but i was wrong about something and then you were like no actually here's the thing about you know why you're wrong and i was like oh Mm. shit thanks for uh you know correcting me that blew me away by the way i literally told my wife about it you won't believe what happened on the internet today I've never heard that before. I've had people just stop, and then I assume, oh, okay, maybe they thought that I was correct about something. But I've never had someone go back like, oh, interesting. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. I was like, is he being sarcastic? (laughs) Oh, no, no, no. Like, I I feel like that's something I want to be a proponent of is, like, where, you know, don't be prideful. Don't dig your heels in Mm. and 
you know, say that this is the way it always has to be. Like, if you don't know something and somebody knows something else and then they tell you, like, that's great. That's an right. opportunity for you to learn. Yeah, that's the attitude I, I like to take, which I think is why we're able to still talk to each other after, you know, discussions like that on the Internet, which yeah, I've been yeah. lucky I, enough to have a lot of people like that around me. I don't even remember what we were talking about. Like, that's how insignificant it was. Yeah, all I, I only remember the just telling my wife, like, you will not believe the response I got. <laughs> And she's like, what? <laughs> it was positive. It was insane. <laughs> <laughs> and you, of course, told her that it was Oni Dino. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know what? She knows <laughs> a lot of the people that I talk to. She knows you for specifically because we talk back and forth. And then, you know, you helping with Japanese. And I'll go like, oh, what's that Hiragana character? And you know what I mean? <laughs> like, she gets really, she's su really supportive of me. I've always been a big learner. I love learning stuff. So with the Japanese, she's actually the one who got me my, my tutor that I, I do every week. So nice. anytime someone helps out with that or something like that, you can bet she she knows your screen name. She's seen your you know picture on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and she is also a streamer herself, and you guys do the podcast together too. You have a podcast as well. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. We do. Um, <laughs> we call it Attack Up, A T K Up, because uh, we're trying to buff our strength with it. <laughs> nice. Yeah, over on YouTube we stream. I think it's a once every two weeks type of deal. Uh, hopefully we can keep that up, but it's just pretty much uh, any nerd stuff we come up with. I think the last one we did was um, anime, and we just covered all kinds of anime stuff. Like uh, I, I'm a bigger fan of the late 90s anime, the hand-drawn stuff, the less uh, computer-driven stuff. And then we talk about favorite series, motion pictures versus series, all kinds of cool stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. And the two of you have like adorable interactions, and it's it's great to to hear like a couple talking about these kinds of things. So. Uh, you guys should definitely check out Attack Up and also check out his wife doing her own stuff on Twitch as well. Uh, PB and Joe, like peanut butter and jelly, but her name's Josine, so PB and Joe on Twitch. There it is, PB and Joe. <laughs> so moving on, I wanted to touch just very briefly on Final Fantasy VIII Remaster. We're getting a lot of gameplay coming out of it. Galen, in particular, you are a big fan of Final Fantasy VIII, right? What do you think yeah. about this remaster? I have connections with Final Fantasy VIII because it was my first Final Fantasy that I really got into. I'm excited to get down on some tri triple triad. I'm excited about grinding and drawing all the magic from all the enemies because that's where probably 80% of my time went into playing mm -hmm. that game. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm I'm very happy because I remember having some questions beforehand. Why have we not seen this sooner? I'm glad that this has finally come back around and we can finally get this remake. Yeah. Yeah, visually, I think that's mostly what got the remaster touches in this. I don't know very much about any quality of life details or anything like that, but mm -hmm. visually, you can see that all the character models have been reworked. Yeah. And honestly, I remember being really happy when I was playing the game originally, and I am trying to figure out what quality of life uh, improvements I would actually want out of the game, but nothing's really coming to mind. So I'm going to assume, and hopefully this is a safe assumption, that they're going to have a fast-forward button, just like they have on their other remasters. Hmm. That's, you know, ah, that's a really good feature to have, and I would never use it, but that's a really smart thing to put in the game, though. Hmm. You know, I thought I would never use it either, but I've been playing uh, Final Fantasy VII on my Switch, and hmm. I've been using that fast-forward button from time to time. Like, not when I'm doing new encounters or anything, but if I'm running mm. from town to town and I've been through this area a couple of times already, right. like, it's great. It also makes it look like it's going at 60 frames a second, so oh, for very brief nice. moments, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really pretty. <laughs> you know, I, I this is such a weird personal hang-up that has no, you know, it's the opposite of what you were talking about before. This is not a well-thought-out opinion. I believe <laughs> even back when Final Fantasy VIII came out and you could uh, skip... Uh, Guardian Force summons. I didn't do it. I felt bad. Like, oh no way! They yeah, put this in the game. Like, I gotta watch this shit. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I think. God, was it even Final Fantasy VII? I forgot which one started doing it in the 3D realm. But you could skip your animations for summons, and mm -hmm. I, absolutely not. That's. I might as well put the game in the trash and not play it yes. and say I did. Okay, so it's good <laughs> to see I'm not the only possible psychopath here. Absolutely, and I think that's why we get along so well. There you go. <laughs> you know, I do have, I have, I did not look at this until um, recently finding out that we'd be talking about it today. I will say there are a lot of things happening here that uh, get the old big thumbs up from me. 
Oh, well, like what? I, you know, I, I probably would prefer the original character models, but upscaling those things would have been a nightmare because that, that affine texture warping that I was um, telling you about uh, mm. takes place on their models because the models are so, uh, let's say, intricate. Yeah, that's probably a good word. Um, yeah. So that picture, you know, the meme that goes around of Renoa telling Squall he's the best looking guy there and his face being all distorted. And they fixed it for this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, you know, part of me would have liked to, for them to have just switched to the original face for that one frame, maybe. <laughs> oh my God, I would too. That would too. have been too good. Um, but, you know, the reason why that happened is because that F affine texture warping would have sometimes the left part of your face lifting up and the right part going down or something based mm -hmm. on your perspective. Uh, so, you know, it, it makes sense why they um, change the character models. And they do kind of clash a little bit. I will tell you the one big thumbs down I have is the very, very blurry um, bilinear filter they seem to have applied to the background, uh, the pre -renders. I was going to mention that too. It's in such contrast with the reworked yeah. models, right? I, I think that they probably could have gotten away with how sharp the 3D character models are. They probably could have gotten away with the more anti-alias, like, stair-stepped look of the originals upscaled. Like, um, I've been playing through the, the Resident Evil 3 Seamless HD project where they used AI upscaling to... Uh, upscale and smooth out the pre-rendered backgrounds. I feel like that could have worked here perfectly. I'm, I'm sh you, yeah. It would be amazing if there's a mod coming, you know, to the Steam version or something, because that would make this like a, a perfect ten for me. I, I like that they replaced the font because a lot of times what they do is with the FF7 Steam release and, and all the HD releases, they just apply a, a blurry filter to the to the text instead of keeping it sharp. But they just replaced mm. it here, it looks like, and it looks crisp and, and it fits the, you know, the, the style of the original, which is always cool. So, oh man, I got, I got stuff to say. So I was going <laughs> to say, uh, my God, I almost called you Cliff. Uh, Galen and I have <laughs> talked about this. Shut up. It's not the first time. <laughs> Galen and I have talked about this before, but I highly suspect that they lost the um, original data for mm. the like 3D models in this game and that's why this remaster took so much longer to come out rather than like the 7 remaster 9 and all right. the other ones that we've seen yeah they may have had to rip all this stuff on the fly and if that's the case that would make sense they wouldn't have the higher res renders of the, the backgrounds and stuff that, yeah yeah that could make a lot of sense that's what ended up happening with the RE1 uh, remake remaster is they just literally trashed all the assets so a lot of times if you're playing in 1080p on let's say like the pc for the re1 remake you'll notice that there's block boundary uh artifact or compression artifacts yes. in, in some of the backgrounds and that literally just comes from them upscaling what was ripped off of the gamecube disc which is pretty yeah, interesting yeah yeah i've never seen that before i've never seen a video game where you had artifact compression and it. it's pretty uh pretty insane <laughs> This does look really, really, really good, though. Like, I'm I'm kind of blown away. I didn't look at anything about it because I kind of just wanted to just keep upscaling the original. But from what mm. I can see, they have they have a, a perfect integer scale here. This seems to be 960p. It's not stretched to full screen, yeah. which is pretty incredible. Yeah. It's pretty cool. I can now read some of the hiragana on the on the command list. I, what is this? Tatakau? Yeah, that means fight. I did not know that, so that's that's brand new for me. So that's pretty cool. I can't read the color yeah. yet, but we're get, we're getting there, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, playing like old video games that you played before when you were younger, but playing them in Japanese now, like that is the best way to learn some good Japanese. That's what I was playing. I was planning on starting with something maybe simple, like a real simple RPG, like Pokemon. I hear a lot of people have have good experience with the uh, hiragana and stuff, so I'm gonna try that out. Yeah, nice. So I wanted to mention though about like the fonts and stuff. I am not a fan of these new soft curved new mm. fonts. I right. much prefer a pixelized font when I'm looking at like an older game. Mm -hmm. Galen and I have talked about this before, and I'm yeah. a bit bit fervent about it. What where are you, where do you stand on this? As far as like the, the font in it? Yeah, yeah. A lot of the fonts that they would use. I mean, I am not as prolific when it comes to reading Japanese or anything like that in it. Oh, no, so. no, I mean, like, English <laughs> or Japanese, it doesn't matter. Just, like, the font. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, I have never really considered it as much uh, when playing the game because, I mean... No, vote right now. I have a gun to your uh, yeah, head. You Pixel to. fonts are brand new. <laughs> 
Uh, I would probably go brand new. Mm. Personally. Oh. I can I can honestly see why you would want the... Oh, it does look like there is a fast-forward function, so that's good. Oh, nice. <laughs> I, I can see where you're coming from for sure, because the look of 2D sprite-based fonts, like, oh, God, you... you just beautiful like they, the mm. the aliasing like it there's something about that that says to me sharpness whereas i know technically yeah. these are sharper because they're at a higher resolution but taking low res you can see each individual pixel that makes up the letter t or whatever you know um i do prefer that myself but this style they're doing right here is much more preferable to what they could have done which would be just apply that bilinear filter over the original text and then call it a day like they did with ff7 one thing i really do wish that they had um redesigned is the ugly text boxes i think i've always hated the ui design in that game it looks yeah. like a like a beta it's seriously mm. just a rectangle with like the most basic gradient feature on it yep mm. i hate the way that it looks mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm with you there i know i know exactly how you feel there's something about not having like a, a border around it like Chrono Cross, FF6, FF7, like we're used to having a text box that looks like a, like an over-designed thing with a, a, yeah. a artwork border around it, you know? All of the embellishment and the yeah. extra on it, yeah. If I'm going to be looking at that thing the entire game, like, yeah. just give me a little visual flair. It does. <laughs> I will say this. I 100% I agree with you. I'd prefer something else, but there's something about the style of this game and this minimalist kind of menu design that just mm. it, it feels uh, how would you say cohesive like it fits sort of I would prefer for them to have something a little nicer looking and to not look so much like a granite slab but uh, yeah. yeah it does kind of fit in with the way their their technology looks and everything has a very smooth look to it and a very minimalist kind of look it's not as complicated as say FF7 when you walk into an area and there's cables hanging down and there's a pipe spewing steam and stuff whereas in yeah. FF8 there's smooth round I love corners that though <laughs> no I, yeah I'm, I'm right there with you for sure I love that that cyberpunk the, the typical Japanese technology has taken over kind of theme I can't get enough of it yeah, you know, I hadn't thought about that, like the, the difference between those two games and their visual design, even though they're mm. sort of set in a, a more future... Well, I don't know if it's Final Fantasy VII is really futuristic, but it's it's more modern compared to, you know, a, yeah. a real fantasy one like Final Fantasy IX. Mm. Uh, it's a great insight. See? <laughs> That's why Jared, should... man. I come with the good stuff for sure. <laughs> you know what? It, you know what was really interesting that I'm sure you probably noticed, if, if not consciously, subconsciously, is... um. The late 90s of anime and video games all look like FF7 with wires everywhere and, and pipes strewn about and like oh, yeah. small quarters and stuff. And I noticed a theme with uh, movies like Akira and um, the Neo Tokyo uh, like animation shorts and stuff. You notice mm -hmm. this theme of like technology taking over and cables coming out of the ground to get you and stuff. And then I went to Tokyo and I was like, oh, that's just how it is. Like, I can understand why people would be scared <laughs> of that. The, the electrical wires in, in a typical, like I stayed in uh, Kita, which like Kitaku is a really nice small town area. And someone like me, who's at least familiar with like uh, electronics and, and electrical engineering, I see these power cables. There's like 30 cables bundled up just in a rat's nest going from building to building and I'm like mm. I can if I was an animator at a big animation studio and I looked out my window I would have all of the inspiration for everything I saw in the late 90s yeah that's and, and you know what FF8 it looks like a J drama to me it's I feel like it was made ah, to be so a Japanese right. drama so totally <laughs> right that's Renoa's character seems like a character in a J drama to me, and then Squall seems like your typical like quiet, introspective like J drama character, and I think it, it's following that. For some reason, in in, in that early two thousands era, J dramas kind of had this like minimalistic, kind of simple design to them. I think it all kind of mm. plays into that. Yeah, you know, I think that Final Fantasy VIII, in my opinion, is very much of its time very mm -hmm. late 90s with yeah. <laughs> Zell with his uh, his jorts his long oh, jorts that he's got the best <laughs> <laughs> that was yeah. actually I think technically my first cosplay that I've ever done is Zell <laughs> oh man you better still have those jean shorts now you could just you can turn those into a cosplay of John Cena with zero alterations <laughs> <laughs> 
or uh, Kevin Smith. Isn't he the one that really likes the jorts? Oh, he loves them. <laughs> so moving on to just something I really briefly wanted to touch on. A game called Remothered is getting a sequel coming in summer of 2020 to everything. Switch, PC, PS4, Xbox. I did not know about this, but I wanted to talk about it just briefly with you, Jared, because, and Galen too, like, we're big fans of the horror games from the PS1, like mm -hmm. Resident Evil, Silent Hill, things like that. I had no idea that Remothered is a game by an Italian game studio that is like a spiritual successor to Clock Tower, and it's apparently like a really good one, if not the best one. Absolutely, yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting that this came up here because I... No joke, like three or four days ago, I had no idea about this this game remothered, and then I watched a video from a YouTuber named Thor High Heels. Dude, who me has too. Really this is exactly yeah. the same thing that happened to me this week. Yes. I love Thor's videos. <laughs> oh, he's so good. He, yeah, he, it's crazy. It's such a weird style, but yeah, he he covered this stuff too, and that was the one that I was interested in. I was like, wow, this is real high quality and it looks interesting as hell. And yeah. then you sent me this link and I was like, no way. There's this is too much of a coincidence. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it, it seems pretty cool. I haven't played it myself, but I did play the PS1 Clock Tower, which I think was the second game in the series. Yeah. And then the PS2 Clock Tower with a female protagonist. I don't remember if that was part three. Um, either way, yeah, like it's 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 interesting as hell seeing this. Um, it looks creepy as all hell. Yeah. No, it, incredibly atmospheric. Uh, anything with uh, ghosts and mirrors, I'm definitely spooked by so that's a very specific <laughs> subgenre there <laughs> it, it, it comes up more often than you think <laughs> <laughs> galen doesn't like his own reflection so that's yeah. very true but I've that's a there. whole another <laughs> you know <laughs> therapeutic uh, dilemma i have to go through <laughs> Yeah, so I just wanted to bring that up because I wanted to bring it to other people's attention too because I've of course heard of this game because of the title. Uh, Remothered Tormented Fathers is the first game and then the next one, I don't know what the what is it subtitle is, but it's still Remothered. And so I would see it come up and I was like, man, that's such a dumb name. And then I move on. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I knew about the game. I thought it was like a Gone yeah. Home style, like, you know, first person kind of spooky it thing, I guess. It does give that kind of feeling mm -hmm. to it for sure. Something about the promotional image was like completely not this clock tower spiritual successor. So just wanted to bring it out there because I know that you're a fan of um, that genre of stuff back in the PS1. Mm -hmm. And then lo and behold, here we are just like maxing out watching Thor High Heels videos. Oh, he's so cool. How crazy is that? There, You know, there's so many content creators on YouTube, but you always end up talking to people who watch the same exact ones as you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the, the birds of a feather. Really, it's like, yeah, I exactly. guess, crows of a feather? I don't know. That's terrible. Oh, I'll take that. Hell yeah. <laughs> and then lastly, I wanted to talk just a bit about Indie World, which came out of Nintendo recently because of Gamescom, I think. They held a like half hour long presentation highlighting a bunch of new indie games that are coming to Nintendo's console. Mm -hmm. And of course, many other consoles as well. Yeah. But Indie World started off... Uh, I have to I have to sort of start off on a low note with this. It has this like hammy, lame voiceovers. I really did not like this direction at all. I was like, uh, <sighs> turn it off right away. Nintendo's been doing this for their indie presentations for a while. Now, I, I mean, at, at least their other indie presentations has been like one of the people like heralding the like indie push for Nintendo consoles. And they've been like kind of awkward, but at least passionate and at least real, you know, reading from a script, of course, but it's at least been that, which I can get down yeah. with, like whatever. But this was like, I guess we're going to try and make jokes and we're also going to really play up the 90s nostalgia of animation. Not my thing. Mm. This is like uh, as fa family friendly as you can get, but it's during a late comedy show. Like it, it's a the wrong <laughs> audience for the tone that they're trying to do. This was Nick at Night, the presentation. <laughs> oh wait, Damn. no, it wasn't. The Nick at Night was like you're the selling it to me is what you're doing. <laughs> Well, let's talk a bit about the games because they really did have a great selection of games on there. The three biggest ones, I think, are like Super Hot, Hotline Miami Collection, and Ori in the Blind Forest. So I wanted to make a bit of a mention about those. I've never played any mm -hmm. of them. Galen, have you played any of these? Ooh. 
Um, I have not, but it's surprising that you mentioned those oh, three man. because those are actually the three that, except for Ori and the Blind Forest, which is a topic we definitely need to talk about in a second, but I was actually the least excited about the other two <laughs> coming to the Switch. Interesting. Yeah, I, I can feel that. Yeah. Uh, you know, Hot, Hotline Miami, I, I like on paper the idea of it, it makes a mm-hmm. lot of sense. I own both the games, and I have not given them a try. I yeah. don't feel like they would be, you know, in my wheelhouse. Like, I don't feel like this would be my thing. Maybe it's just me. I could be crazy. I tend to do this a lot where I just prejudge and overthink for no reason at all. <laughs> they just, mm-hmm. they do not seem like my type of deal. But Ori and the Blind Forest is a Metroidvania, which is, you couldn't get any closer to my type of deal. Yeah. Right? That's pretty cool. <laughs> And it's it's really good. The graphics are really cool, and it's 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 a, me and my wife. Uh, we streamed it a long time ago when she first started streaming, and it oh. it's a it's a really interesting game, and it's cute as all hell, and it mm-hmm. has this wispy kind of ambient feeling to it. Very good stuff. I have been wanting to play this game for so long, and I never picked it because it came out. Was it originally for the uh, the 360 or the Xbox One? I can't remember which. But it originally came out as a Microsoft exclusive. I played it exclusive. on Steam. Yeah. That makes sense, yeah. It's it's really, really cool. It does require a lot of platforming like, skill, mm-hmm. which is kind of cool. Compared to other Metroidvania games where you collect a bunch of like uh, power-ups that let you explore more, this game is like you collect power-ups that have you having to get better at the game, which is really cool. Yeah. Oh, that sounds exciting. Th- those are the reasons why I was interested in this game, too. I was thinking like, okay, it's going to be a compromised experience coming from an Xbox to a Switch, but the developers even confirmed that on TV it's going to be 1080 60, which awesome. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, <laughs> everything about this game is appealing to me right now. Like, yeah. I I love the aesthetics of it, of course, but the music also really catches me. Um, I've actually oh, ended so up good. using this music in a couple of D and D games uh, that I've been her <laughs> DMing. So, like, it's it's incredibly atmospheric and sets just the right tone depending on what you're looking for so i'm very excited to play this one and then going back to uh hotline miami collection i've never played these games i've always heard lots about them sort of the same thing as jared like it sounds like it should be kind of my thing but i'm not so sure like it reminds Mm. me of loaded and reloaded back on the playstation Mm -hmm. one because it's top down you know um and i know that suda 51 is a big fan of these games so Honestly, that's good enough endorsement for me, so I'm sure eventually I'll pick him up and try him out, but (laughs) that man is a crazy person. Yeah, he absolutely is. We need more crazy Japanese people making video games, please. Yeah. (laughs) You know what the crazy thing about Suda51 is that I really like? is he is incredibly hit or miss in my for my own personal taste. Oh, I agree. Like he, He can make a really good game, and then a game that just I don't care at all about. Uh huh. But the fact that he takes so many chances with yeah. everything that he does means that's how it's going to be. It's always mm-hmm. going to be that way, which is, uh, you know, I like that. You know, I like it when a game, I, I cover a lot of games that are like experimental that don't necessarily work, but I appreciate that they took the time to experiment, you know? Yeah. Even if it's not for me, I'm like, you know what? I really respect what he did here. And it's so interesting at the very, very least it's interesting. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think you can kind of say that about like, uh, you, you can't paint with a broad brush, but I will say that like indies in general, I feel like I'm always more excited about an indie presentation versus some sort of AAA presentation because it's going to have more heart to it and more chances. Um, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes they rest on the laurels of like retro feel. This is going a bit off topic, but comparing some of these games here to something like Square Enix's Marvel's Avengers that we saw a lot of gameplay coming out of uh, <laughs> Gamescom. Yeah. I was really hard on that game before, and like it looks better, you know, with the the details that are coming out on that. But I mean, it still looks like the most focus tested, unoffensive AAA mainstream game ever, and it looks mm-hmm. so bland to me in terms mm-hmm. of like creativity. And that's what I want out of my games is I want some creativity. I'm sure that game's gonna play fine and be fun, just looking at the gameplay, but it doesn't have life in it. Yeah. Well, and a big thing to go with that is that these companies are trying to make money, and the best way to do that is to kind of diversify your interests on what you're actually coming out with. So, 
you're going to see more chances in the indie titles than with your big AAA titles. So yeah. it reminds me of the movie industry, honestly, because it's like exactly. as soon as so much money gets mm-hmm. put into it, they have to focus test it, make it unoffensive, and make sure it's mm-hmm. like you know checking all the boxes on. Okay, everybody wants a, a third person action game with light RPG elements and quippy yeah. dialogue. It's just like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> Survival mechanics, can't forget that. Crafting, gotta have it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and loot drops, yeah. of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And a roadmap of content. <laughs> yeah, you're definitely right about that. I will say that there is the opposite end of the coin, which is a lot of indie games tend to chase after the other indie games that made it. That's which true. Which does tend to suck. Um, so you can see that kind of happen, not to as as hard of a degree as it does in AAA gaming but it can be a little disconcerting to open Steam and see you know 30 of the same game over and over again yeah but the ones that do rise to the top the cream of the crop you know per se you you do tend to see those be the ones that took the chances and went outside of the the generalized norms of, of the popular indie stuff right yeah, and I mean, regardless, even even when it is sort of an imitation of another game, if they do a little bit that's like their own thing, or even if they don't and they're still just trying, but it still ends up being a good experience, um, I'm I'm glad because I'm also supporting like a smaller creator, and also it was only ten dollars instead of sixty, you know? Yeah. So yeah. It, it just all around, I just feel better about it on a, on a personal level. I'm not saying it's you know for everybody. It's just no, just I an get Oni that Dino for sure. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> it does help to know that you're you're really and truly supporting somebody. Kind of like yeah. when you when you go to a local show and you see a band and you buy one of their shirts, you know all of that money is going into their pocket. Type Absolutely, of deal. yeah, all about that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then going back, I just want to say a bit about Super Hot. I just know that this is like a turn-based first-person action game with lots of shooting elements. Now, when you say turn-based, you've got my attention. So. Well, not really. Is it not? Yeah, not really. <laughs> no. So no. It, oh it, my God! It's, school me both. So <laughs> it's really interesting in the fact that time moves forward when you make a movement in the game. So you can actually sit there, oh. look at the screen, plan out your movements, and if you see bullets coming at you, you can actually step to the side to dodge those bullets. But it's also really unique because you can actually grab the bullets out of midair and throw them back, or you can like survey the scene and then go okay i'm going to take his gun i'm going to shoot it three times and then throw it at this other guy like it gives you that kind of matrix-esque moment of i'm going to stop look at what i'm doing and then i'm going to go ahead and do it so it's not focused on the action it's planning out your moves and everything like a puzzle Um, in a way yeah yeah Definitely. And the cool thing is, is when you're done with the level and you've done all those things in slow motion, it'll show you a replay in real time of how it would have looked had you have just ran through and done this with like superhuman reflexes. And yeah, it's, it's pretty <laughs> cool. <laughs> so have you guys played this game? Uh, I mm-hmm. have not actually. Um, and the reason that I have not played it is because I really want to play the VR experience first. Oh, that is, cool that is what that I be? want my first experience to be. Okay. Because I've seen other people playing this game in VR, and the ability to actually reach up, grab the bullet with your actual hand, and move it aside, like, that is, you've got me sold on that. (laughs) I feel like this game was made for that kind of an environment. Yeah, for sure. That is my only hesitation, because this game looks amazing otherwise. Are you telling me that you don't want to play the Labo VR Super Hot Toy Con Edition? You know what? If they came out with that, I would buy it. Oh, I would it sounds buy like a Labo. garbage. <laughs> I would buy a Labo and play Super Hot. <laughs> I'm glad. Okay, so I kind of thought that all Nintendo fans thought that that was like the coolest thing, and I'm glad to see that that's not the case. <laughs> because boy, did I criticize that. I think that it is an interesting thing and um, a diverse part of their catalog. And um, mm-hmm. it is certainly, you know, baby's first VR experience. And it is, you know, mm. 50 bucks, 60 bucks or something like that. And you can get it cheaper, I guess, on sale. And that's the uh, yeah. quickest entry point for VR for kids, I guess. So it serves yeah, a purpose, I, I think. But I mean, I think they lost a lot of money on it. 
Oh, do you think so? I think that from reports, we found that it wasn't like as successful as they were hoping it would be, but it wasn't unsuccessful for them. Really yeah. interesting. I yeah. just from from the negative. I I might be in my own little uh, you know, opinion box where I don't see a lot of dissenting stuff. But it seems uh-huh. like everybody seems to be of the opinion like, oh, this is a bad idea. It doesn't doesn't really work that well, or it's not that great. But oh, I think okay. that's probably because I feel that way, and I tend to see all those around me go like, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. They do have a uh, labo for Smash Bros. So, I mean, can't all Jesus be bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So from what I, I hear, I think that there's a mixed response depending on the game. Um, I think that the the actual like labo VR thing that they came out with, with all those mini games in it, I think that that was well received. Um, mm-hmm. Just like their, okay. their sort of retrofitting uh applications of it in like mario and zelda have been poorly received i think Uh, okay i think it's undersold but it's been okay yeah it's i view i view the labo um games like the labo proper uh same way that i do nintendo land for the wii u like it's fun if you get your friends together and you play it, it you're gonna have a good time but it's not a everlasting thing that is going to bring back memories for years to go. It's like, oh, hey, I've got this new console or this new um, idea of how to play the game. Mm -hmm. This is a great way to showcase some of those ideas. But it's a list of ideas. It is not a dedicated game. Yeah, Uh, I gotcha. I like the idea of it being aimed at, like, creative children who are, I don't know, say around nine years old or something like that. And they're, Mm -hmm. you know, tweakers and tinkerers, like two of you guys. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and they like the idea of like, oh, I can build something, you know, by hand and maybe even build it with like my older brother or sister or my parent or something and like have that experience. But I think that that's like so many different factors rolled into one that it ends up making it sort of a small market that um, I like it being uh, aimed at. So yeah. I don't know. I-, I think that it serves its purpose, but it's a smaller market than really anything. And I think anybody that was like genuinely upset by this, like, this is not what I want. I think that they are entirely huge man children. And <laughs> I think that they need to realize that it probably wasn't aimed for them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I saw a lot of people upset about that. And I'm like, oh, God, this ru- the world is ruined. Set it on fire. Let's find a new planet. What yeah, do you, you mean know, this isn't the driving experience I was expecting to get from my racing game? This is a cardboard <laughs> steering wheel. How is this not accurate? <laughs> I think you bring up a very valid point there that I, I try to touch on as, as much as humanly possible. Hmm. There are just some games that aren't made for you, and I think I've become happier realizing that. There's sometimes yeah. when a game comes out and everybody... Oh, yeah. I can look at it, and a part of me wants to go, oh, like, the part of me that doesn't enjoy that wants to make a, a, a kind of objective, like, determination, like, oh, this is bad. And uh, the the more rational part of me goes, eh, it's just not for me. And yeah. so anytime someone asks me, hey, have you tried this game out? I was like, yeah, it looks like, yeah, that's just, that's not my thing. And I've kind of felt that way. You know what? It was the Resident Evil retrospective. I didn't, I, <laughs> for the longest time, I could not stand the more action-focused, over-the-shoulder RE games. Mm-hmm. And then I started playing them as not Resident Evil games. And I found out, oh, these just, eh, it's no big deal. Like, these are fun for what they are. They're just not for me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was very on that, that, that spectrum, though. I was like, no, it's bullshit. They're all bad. Let me tell you all the reasons they're bad. <laughs> Except for Operation Raccoon City. I think everybody can agree that it's just not a... Not, no. <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. Yeah, get into <laughs> oh, it, Jared. Okay. I legitimately really enjoy Operation Raccoon City. What? I, I can admit <laughs> it has a lot of faults. As far as, as, as objective like game design stuff goes, there are a lot of faults there. But there's something about you and like three other people running through the streets of Raccoon City and headshotting zombies. Like when there's a horde of zombies coming at you and you have an SMG and you're just blowing chunks off of them. Mm-hmm. Oh, good. And that's another game I've only ever played single player. Never tried the multiplayer, which a lot of really? people say is the the draw. There's something about it. I don't know. I would say, if anything, <laughs> it, ch- mindless shilling here. Check out my video on it. At the yeah. very, I get into kind of in, in depth with it as far as what I enjoy. I'm uh, I am definitely going to have to watch that video. Uh, I'll probably actually watch it right after this because nice. uh, 
Operation Raccoon City, I pre-ordered the legendary or whatever the special edition <laughs> version because I was really excited. Why would you do that? I had got uh, because I spend way too much money on this kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> they got me when I was young. I don't know any better. <laughs> Uh, but I got my buddies into it. I was like, okay, let's all get this. We'll get it for the same system. This is going to be fantastic. Yeah. This is the only game that I can think of that after a week of owning it, I took it back and traded it in. Like, I've never, never heard never more disappointment that. in your voice, Galen. <laughs> I, I have never done that for any game that I have ever owned that I have traded it in after owning it for only a week. But this yeah. was bad enough to the point where it's just like, I cannot do this. Hmm. I get it. I went through yeah, the I entire did. campaign. I went through the entire thing, and I was just like, nope, done. Yeah, yeah, I I, I can understand that. I, I definitely can. I even, in my video, I say, like, if you don't like this game, fair enough, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> uh, it's it, I can totally get that. But there's something about the small bit of, uh, what would you say it like there's there's a small a gem there of something that's really fun and every once in a while you latch onto that and there'll be a wave of zombies and mm -hmm. it, you'll just you'll be like oh I, I've, I've got it this is it and then <clears throat> I'll be going through the labs and my uh, Ryzen 7 1700 and GTX 1070 Ti will slow down on a eight year old Resident Evil game and I'll get super <laughs> pissed off and then I'll go yeah this is why people don't like this damn game <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I start to get have that horde come down at me, and I'm just like, uh, I think I'm just gonna go play Left 4 Dead. <laughs> mm, I get that. Yeah, I, I get, there's something about it. It hit me though. Like, I won't tell you it's a good game, but I will tell you you can have fun with it. Yeah, and that's something that I always found so interesting about so many of your reviews of like the Resident Evils that I didn't like or I just definitely wasn't interested in, like Six mm. or. Uh, Operation Raccoon City because you went into it and were looking for the good, you know, surrounded mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. the shit, you found the diamond covered in poop. And <laughs> exactly. It was really great to hear somebody talk about it rather than just be like, "Oh, this is why it's bad and, you know, oh, it's just it's just completely a mess." And it's like, "Well, it's not a complete mess. It's definitely mm -hmm. messy, but let's talk yeah. about isolating some of these good parts." And that made it infinitely more interesting to listen to rather than just hear somebody else in my echo chamber. Mm -hmm. So here's the crazy thing about that. For me, being as negative as I am about those games or how I used to be, that's why that was such an accomplishment for me. For you to be able to say that is blowing my mind because when I went into <laughs> it, when I started the retrospective, let's say I was playing 1, 2, and 3, and I was like, oh, mm -hmm. I can't. This is going to be terrible when I end up getting to those later games. And then I kind of, I, I figured it out. I was like, wait a minute, just play them and act like they're not Resident Evil games. And I was in heaven after that. Yeah. <laughs> then you can start to see the flaws and you stop going, well, this isn't survival horror. And you start going, well, you know, they could have made movement a little easier here or maybe placed enemies better there. And you start being a little more objective about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But like games like RE6, I was, I had never touched before. I, I, I had sworn it off. No joke. I'd, I'd never oh. played it. I didn't watch any reviews. I was just like, no, I'm not supporting this in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, And yeah. Uh, I played it on PC, and I was like, wow. Like, video game-wise, not Resident Evil-wise, this game has the best controls in the series. It's, it's oh, very really? fluid. You have a lot of... Yeah, oh, for sure. For me, at least personally, playing RE4, and I just went back and, and started playing it again. I was streaming it. Uh, just very rigid controls. You are trapped into this very rigid... You're turning this way, and then you're turning this way 30 degrees to the left now, mm -hmm. and there's no in-between. Yeah, it's over-the-shoulder tank controls. Yeah, it definitely is. It's exactly, because forward always moves you forward, left and right, rotates you on your axis. So it, it definitely is. And then RE5 was a looser form of that, but just barely. And then yeah, you play yeah. RE6, and RE6 actually plays, as far as controls go, I was playing on PC, so I was using mouse and keyboard, and that's how I did RE2 Remake, too, so I can compare. Mm. And RE6 plays more like RE2 Remake than it does RE4, without a doubt. So for me, though, like playing RE2 Remake a bunch and then going back mm. to playing RE6 uh, when I was at E3, I was like, oh, God, this feels like just garbage. Like it feels like 
okay, maybe they were, you know, trying to evolve the controls and stuff, and I do appreciate mm-hmm. dodge rolls and stuff. Hopefully we see that right. coming back for the 3 remake. But I feel yeah. like the RE2 remake controls were so well done. And then... Oh, yeah, for sure. Six, I just can't get behind. I Yeah, I can understand that. The thing is, is I played RE6 before RE2 remake even yeah, came yeah. out. I was almost done with the retrospective before remake actually hit shelves. Right. So... <laughs> I have not went back to it since playing RE2 Remake, but when playing RE2 Remake, I remember going like, wow, this is relatively familiar based on what I knew. You can do a lot with RE6's controls, and the cool thing is with RE2 Remake, you can dash, you can move left or right, or you can uh, use a usable item once you get attacked, whereas with RE6, you can you can dive roll, and then you could dodge backwards, stay on the ground, roll <laughs> left or right while on the ground. It's a very deep system. I felt like a system that probably came from a game that was more action focused than RE6 was. Yeah, yeah. Um, if that would have been like how Max Payne 3 controlled, holy shit. Oh, that would have yeah, changed exactly. the game. You know? Yeah. Um, so, as a video game, I could see things about 6 that was good. As, as far as like a Resident Evil game goes, uh, it doesn't even count. You, you can't yeah. even call it RE. <laughs> Uh, but what you can do is say that, like, yeah, there were a few campaigns that weren't good, but start up Leon's campaign, play mm-hmm. through the subway system, you're probably going to have a decent time. Just imagine it's called something else. Yeah. I kind of forgot, like, all of RE6. The only thing I really remember is the church with uh, Leon and, and Girl, and mm. then going <laughs> underneath the church. <laughs> Which yeah. both were very not fun parts of the game. Yeah, those are the only parts that I really remember. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, that's probably... Oh, God, those parts were so... just They drug on and on. <laughs> it was terrible. And then, like, the worst graphical aspect of the game was there. There was a cool enemy design, though, in that church. Yeah, the one that was turning people into zombies. Yeah, the, it was like, like a titty boss, monster, yeah. and then it shot out, yep. like, zombie gas, which was a dumb concept, but cool. You know, if you're going to have a titty monster, you should probably shoot out zombie gas, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, I, I'm kind of a sucker for titty monsters, so... Of course, yeah, who wouldn't be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of bad with that game. And that's a long-winded uh, explanation on why being objective on Nintendo Labo is good. Absolutely. For titty monsters? <laughs> there well, it is. They, those just, they just serve to... <laughs> I can't take that any further. <laughs> <laughs> When are we going to get Labo VR titty monsters? Nintendo. Put it in Metroid. It'll fit right in there. Ooh. Just make make Metroid a freaking M-rated HR Giger nightmare. Nightmare scape. It's going in that direction. Come on. That's why what not I just want. take it the whole way? Yeah. <laughs> Commit to it all. Yeah. And so indie games are good. Let's move on to (laughs) our additional DLC segment where we recommend media to our lovely listeners. Galen, what do you have to recommend this week? So this week I've got, you know what? I've been playing a lot of Destiny in my spare time. And I keep thinking about that comment that you made a couple episodes about Destiny not having a story. I feel really (laughs) bad about how I treated you on that Destiny 2 Schluter episode. So... You, of course, should redeem yourself by telling me why (laughs) Destiny 2 is good for you. So, you know what? I am going to let the content creator, my name is Bife, do that for me. So, he is my additional DLC this week. Uh, He was the one that I mentioned a little while ago, and what he does is he looks over the lore and the stories and the, the bit of world building that Destiny is so good at that not a lot of people know it's there because it doesn't hand feed everything to you you kind of get bits and pieces of it from all the things that you collect item wise he takes everything puts it into one uh, one narrative and tells you the story and tells you what is so fascinating about it all so the video i'm linking to is specifically the tale of two of the legendary weapons you have the last word in thorn and it's more about the the tale of the one who wielded Thorn originally, his fall from grace, and how he became essentially this Dark Knight character who would go around and use this evil magic to 
prove his own means, which are might still be for the good of everybody. We don't know. And this, uh, these other guys, I won't spoil it by any means, but it is a fantastic listen. It, he does it in a way where it is almost like a novel. Like, the thing is like an hour long, but he really does a good job of er, in capturing your attention. So... Uh, yeah, check him out. My name is Bife. He does fantastic work. He also does more than just Destiny stuff. He also does things on, like, Monster Hunter. He's going to be doing Borderlands soon. Um, he covers a little bunch of different ranges, but he always talks about the lore of video games indirectly, so. Alright, sounds good. Redeeming himself <laughs> on the Destiny 2 front from when I just dragged him through the mud. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have no right defending the microtransactions in that game, though. Like, because I've been playing it more, I've realized more of the changes they've been making, and uh, it's, it's, I want to bang my head against the wall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for me, I am going to recommend a new video from SNES Drunk on YouTube. SNES Drunk is an excellent creator who reviews a lot of Super Nintendo games, sometimes Genesis games, sometimes jumps out from there very succinctly. And... He always has these great little intro videos to what you might already be interested in or something you maybe didn't hear about from yesteryear. This video is on Mischief Makers for the Nintendo 64. That is one of my favorite flawed gems, which is a personal take on Trash Classics, okay, Jared? <laughs> I like it. It is one of my favorite flawed gems from the 64. The boss fights, the varied gameplay, and the weird set pieces in that game are so unique and charming. So if you're interested in games that try and do something a little different, uh, SNES Drunk's video on it will help prep you to see if you should give it a go or not. Also, he's a super cool guy. Yeah, he is. <laughs> you, you know what? I, this has always been my impression of him. And for some reason, every time I click on one of his videos, which are always really good, Mm. Uh, I think the same thing, and I'm like, here's a guy who, he bought a SNES EverDrive and made a career out of it. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can tell every single one of his videos is, I have a full ROM list of US and Japanese uh, SNES games. Uh, let's do an episode real quick. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's a super cool guy. I, I always appreciate it when a YouTuber that's much bigger than me, that gains nothing from talking to me, uh, you know, sends out a, a message on Twitter. So I'm like, yo, I thought that episode was cool because oh. like, not only is that cool from another creator who, you know, you watch his stuff. So you, you, you kind of, uh, one creator to another, it's like, it's, it's pretty cool getting a compliment, but also mm -hmm. like, that's the most selfless thing ever because they're not getting any clout from talking to someone with 36,000 subs, you know? Yeah. So yeah. that's pretty cool. Yeah. Personally, I've always kind of felt that that feeds the YouTube dream of content creators who just enjoy making the content and mm -hmm. also enjoy talking to other people about a similar interest and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's how it, that's how it should be for sure. <laughs> I agree. And that's why I like, I like to search out people and talk with people like, you know, you or I mean, Super Derek or whatever, because they're people that are just genuinely passionate about the games and like yeah. that's that's all I ever care about. <laughs> not only that, but Super Derek's got the, the best hair in the game. Bar none. <laughs> Without a doubt. Yeah, he and Zell could have a match on uh, hair fights. Oh my god, why have I never made that connection before? <laughs> <laughs> so, um back in like, I don't know, ninety seven or whenever Mischief Makers actually came out. The local game store, it was that family video that sells CBD and burritos. <laughs> <laughs> but back in 97, they were still doing the video game thing because uh, that was still lucrative back then. They had, for some reason, a Japanese version of Mischief Makers and the English version. And I didn't know this, but I'm guessing the 64 was region free because I could pop that cartridge right into my console and play it. Do you know anything about that, Jared? Uh um, well, it is technically region-free as far as software is concerned, like all okay. of my Japanese carts work, but it's a lot like the SNES where there are tabs that prevent Japanese cartridges from going into a console, at least on the first, I've only ever played with a Gen 1, you know, your release era, yeah. uh, uh, N64, but there was these uh, little square tabs in the part where the ca cartridge slots in. Uh, they're just plastic. It's just like the uh, the Super Nintendo where you can take pliers and t 
take them out except for you need uh something a little more substantial because they're they're bigger and and mm. more uh man it's really hard to explain what they are really they're just yeah. it's just a square notch inside of the plastic that you have to get rid of and i just took some uh like flush cuts and, and cut them out it's <laughs> plastic so it's pretty easy but yeah you can plug in a, a japanese game into a 64 and play it right off the bat we were just doing it the other day with a uh, kirby 64 yeah yeah it was on that stream that was that was a good stream. oh that's right yeah you were nice I watched her video the other day of uh, the HDMI adapter for the N64 and the SNES. And, like, when I saw you take apart the SNES at that one part and start (laughs) cutting and, like, gutting the plastic away, I was just like, this man gets it. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) You do what needs to be done. (laughs) That's one of the two possible reactions there. One of them should have been your heart sinks in your chest a little bit, and the other one should be like, yeah, no. He gets it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Mischief Makers with that Japanese version and that English version, I would rent both of them and then like swap them out and play them. That was like a big inspiration to, I don't know what I was, like 11 year old at that time. Mm. It was a big inspiration to me on uh, learning Japanese. Nice. I had a yeah. similar situation with Grandia too. I used oh, to. Nice. Oh, nice. This is getting back there. Okay, so this is showing my age. Me and a buddy of mine ran a website. Because, you know, the Dreamcast was uh, famously easy to pirate for. Yeah. So what we would do is <laughs> um, back when you had a, a, what was essentially a, a 56K modem, uh, downloading ISOs, like disk images, um, really wasn't super viable. So mm-hmm. what we would do is is we traded disks. So we would have a website started where you had our AIM information and you'd message oh. us, hey, I have Blue Stinger, and I have this, this, and that. So it would be like, all right, well, we have this, this, and that. So you send 20 games. I'll send 20 games, little CDRs and a spindle. And uh, so I had oh, cr- just an unbelievable amount of Dreamcast games. And one time, a guy sent us Grandia 2. I started it up. It was the Japanese version, but my <laughs> U.S. save file worked from my VMU. And oh. I was playing through in Japanese, and I was like, "This is this is what it's like to live in Japan, right here." <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome! I remember those kinds of websites too. Like those things were pretty popular for CDs as well. Oh yeah. Oh man, that's awesome! I'm playing the Grandia Two right now on the HD collection um, that just came out for the Switch, and that's so cool. That's so uh, so topical. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So we're running long on this episode, so unfortunately we're going to have to just 86, our favorite segment of the week. It pains me. Do you hear the pain in my voice? I don't like, I don't like ignoring the mails, the listener mail. You're taking away my, my one ability to sing during this episode and I'm so sad. I'm pulling back the curtain on this because he's sandbagging me right now. Bitch, you said we should skip it if we go long. Do not even try and put this on me. See how he's the mean one sometimes? No, I, I will say this. Uh, this is 100. I probably should have warned you beforehand when you messaged me. Uh, I, I should have said I rant like a lot. <laughs> no, no, it's good. It's, it's not your fault by any means. So... Unfortunately, we will be skipping the emails. However, we do have several emails that we still need to read. So thank you very much to the people that sent them ahead of time. Thank you for your patience. And if you want to be as patient as those people, you can write into us. You can ask video game questions, life advice questions. Clearly, we uh, are very dependable people. What are we here? Uh, Send us an email, nintendoeverythingpod at gmail.com. That email one more time is nintendoeverythingpod at gmail.com. Oh, and like I said in the beginning of the episode, if we didn't talk about something that you wanted us to talk about this week in game news, just ask. Yeah. (laughs) Great. Great commentary. Thank you, Galen. (laughs) (laughs) So what is coming up? What is coming out on nintendoeverything.com? We have a ton of stuff. We have some information coming straight out of Inti Creates. We have an interview on the future of the Gunvolt series as well. We also have some interviews on the upcoming Contra Rogue Corps. Got some deep dive information on Sonic and... Wait, what's that called? Mario and Sonic Olympic Games Tokyo 2020 or... It's a long title. Whatever (laughs) whatever that game is called. Extra information on that that nobody knows yet. And also a bit of an interview highlight 
from Monolith Soft that you're going to want to check all those things out on our website. Don't know if that was a correct sentence. NintendoEverything.com. <laughs> <laughs> Losing my mind. You can also stay connected to Nintendo Everything on Twitter at Nin Everything and our YouTube, youtube.com slash Nin Everything. Then you can talk to me about video games, which is the lamest thing I've ever said in my life. <laughs> on Twitter <laughs> at Oni <laughs> underscore Dino. Then I've got an Instagram where I'll try to put a picture of me and my husband this week. We're really bad at taking pictures. My Instagram is at Oni underscore underscore Dino. And then, because I mentioned my husband, we do a YouTube that we just recently started called Game Married. G-A-Y-M-E Married on YouTube. And uh, we've been playing some uh, Marvel, some retro indie games, especially Never Give Up. That is a ton of fun. And we kind of kind of lose our minds there. That game gets you hyped immediately. Our friends at Massive Monster <laughs> have created an excellent game with that. So check out our YouTube. And then we have a Twitter where you can uh, figure out what our uh, upload schedule is. The Twitter is at Game Married. And just a bit of a Oshirase, what the f is Oshirase in English? Notification. Uh, just a bit of a notification to people. Our upload schedule is just going to be temporarily changing. We are not going to be uploading seven days a week because Tokyo Game Show is coming up and I'm getting kind of busy. So just temporarily, gotta, gotta slow it down a little. That's going to be uploads on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays for sure. And then maybe a fourth day if, if you know things are going real good. But definitely three days a week, and that's just going to be a temporary thing. So, please understand, as Iwata says. <laughs> then Galen, what about you? Where can people find you doing what? Um, I got a Twitter. Go ahead and shoot me a message. That's all I got. <laughs> Well, I'm just like, well, I'm no, sitting so here listening to me question. like, well, we've got a podcast coming up and we've got these articles and I've got an Instagram and I've got a Twitter well, can, and I'm can just they like, talk to you about video games on Twitter. That's the question. I make silly <laughs> posts sometimes and sometimes throw out an inspirational thing to anybody who wants to hear it. That's and where right. can they hear it, Galen? <laughs> they can hear it at my Twitter, which is mo at Mobius 087. <laughs> And then our special guest of this week, Jared from Avalanche Reviews. What do you do? Where can people find you? Oh man, I missed, I just thought of this. I missed out on the perfect opportunity for me to say, who are you? What are you doing here? Oh my God. <laughs> Hindsight's always 2020. That would have been perfect. Yeah. Guys, I'm a maniac. Why did you bite me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, I am Jared from Avalanche Reviews. You can find me on YouTube at Avalanche Reviews, uh, Twitter at Avalanche Jared, or just search Avalanche Reviews. I'm pretty sure I'm the only one there that isn't reviewing the, I think the, there's a Chevy truck called an Avalanche. <laughs> oh, gosh. I used to get mixed up with a lot in the YouTube algorithm. I've, I've carved out my section of YouTube now to where you don't see Chevy trucks, so that's good. <laughs> or... Some of your listeners are really devoted Chevy fans. Yeah, one or the other. I would not be surprised <laughs> if there's a little cross-pollinization between our two communities. <laughs> what else do I do? Oh, on Twitch, uh, uh, Avalanche Reviews as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter. Like I said, I respond to everything, and I will tweet something that will piss you off at some point. Don't worry, that's natural. That's just part of following me on Twitter. <laughs> And uh, you also have a podcast, too. Don't you want to push that? That is correct. I do have the Attack Up podcast with my absolutely adorable wife, uh, PB and Joe. And uh, we argue with each other, and then I become too foul-mouthed, and then she yells at me, and it's the cutest interactions you've ever seen in your life. Yep. <laughs> I can vouch for it. <laughs> so, Jared, thank you so much for joining us on the show, and we had such great conversations about all these different tangents that we went off on. You are welcome back on this show absolutely. anytime. Hell yeah. I'll be back again for sure. Thank you very much. Nice. <laughs> so, Galen, another episode in the bag. This was 43. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. We're, uh, we're coming up to uh, 52, actually. 
pretty soon, and that's that's quite impressive to me. Fifty-two? Well, yeah, because it's it's a weekly podcast. You can catch us every week on Sundays. Are there fifty-two weeks in a year? Aren't there? What are you getting at? Well, it, if this wasn't pre-planned, we... then you guys are pulling this off perfectly. <laughs> We honestly don't pre-plan anything. We pre-plan what topics we'll talk about, and that's it. I thought this was the most, like, well-acted, like, oh, it's 52. You can find us every Sunday. And I'm like, oh, man, this is the best information I've ever... (laughs) Right? Right? And there are, in fact, 52 weeks in a year, give or take. Boom. All right. I'm really confused. So if you're smarter than me, you will have appreciated what Galen just said. You can check us out every Sunday... I wanted to bring up the fact that episode 52 will be the one year anniversary of this uh, channel. Oh. Yeah, that, that, that was what I was trying to lead to before confusion set in. In nine more weeks. <laughs> yes. So that's something to look forward to. That's awful. <laughs> <laughs> So, if you are here at the very end for the long haul, why don't you be like Eric, who just wrote into us and said that he wrote us a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, whatever it's called now. They keep changing. Just the internet keeps changing. <laughs> Eric is awesome. Be as awesome as Eric and write us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to us. Apple Podcasts is the best, though, because it kind of gets us out there and in front of new eyes, which I'm going to keep saying this all the time. We would really appreciate it. <laughs> Don't laugh at me, Galen. I'm always going to laugh at you. (laughs) There's so much editing in this episode, Galen. (laughs) Laughing at my pain. So, finally, Jared, thank you very much. Galen, whatever. That's a perfect ending right there. You'll be here next week. (laughs) Yeah, I'll I'll be here next week. (laughs) So stay tuned for next week and for everything Nintendo. Stay tuned to Nintendo Everything. My god, he actually remembered it this week. (laughs) Firing you. (laughs) Uh, See you next week, everyone. (laughs) That was fun.